You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I put him on my lap and his lips were moving. I thought, oh, he's okay. And that was it. That was his last movement. Um, and then I was, went and stayed in the bedroom where the coffin was. Uh, that was hard. And then Keith made us pick him out the coffin. And I was only 10, gave him a kiss and that. And it was horrible. And I ended up with loads of chicks for a few years. I remember Roy Keane once. I just taught him all the time. Because I said he was a new kid on the block. And I remember going down the tunnel and I said, Roy, you reckon you're the new kid in the block? Welcome to your worst nightmare. And it was one more nil, but he said afterwards in the in the papers, he said, "Thank God that game's over with." He says, "I've never been talked to so much in my life." I used to say, "I'm I'm having, I'm sleeping with your wife." <laughs> Evan in the nineteens, and I was up in his office, and he says, "Gaza, what's this kid?" And I says, "How old is he?" Went fourteen. I said, "What's his name?" He said, "Wayne Rooney." And I says, "On the nineteens, he's only fourteen. He went, "Yeah, put him on in a minute." I think it was 20 minutes ago, and I put him on. Fucking hell, he scored two goals. It was incredible. Looking back in the semi-final, Paul, do you wish you would have took a penalty? Yeah, you know, my mind was just all over the place, you know. Sometimes it was OK, sometimes it was scary. I just felt like I couldn't go anywhere. I felt trapped indoors. Um, I mean, the, the, the public were fantastic towards us, but just wherever I went, you know. Um, and then, obviously, then the press started, and that's when I found it really hard, because the, the amount of lies... The amount of lies they had on us was just horrific, you know, they were just constantly telling lies. It was murder. I even, I, sometimes I'd be in London and I'd see a couple of cars and a motorbike behind us and I'd have to ring up the police, pull over, police come up, block them in and make me drive off. And then obviously there was the phone hacking. And I went to the toilet in the dark, it was two o'clock, and I touched the door handle. Next thing I know, I've got someone with a hand around my neck with a gun to me head. He just said, you know, if you score, do the sash. And I went, what's a sash? He says that, and he showed us. He says, the fans that love it. When he said that, and he says, the fans that love it, and I went, ooh, I'll do anything for the fucking fans. I says, what's, what was he going to kill us? I went, yeah. He said, fuck me, what are you going to do about it? I went, nothing. He says, until he comes to the, our country, so we're not going to hang around the airport. So when I used to play, I used to look in the crowd and fucking look to see if anyone's got a gun and that. You know, if I think of any, any teams, I'd, I'd love to play, go back and play for all, but Rangers be the one. Well, when you quit, you think, what am I going to do now? You know, and I didn't really want to go into management. I did try it, kept in manager. It's funny, the chairman says, Paul, get out of the third division. I did, I put them in the fucking fourth. <laughs> <laughs> After that, you know, that round war thing, I really honestly thought it was my friend and I didn't realise what he had did to other people until obviously after about two weeks when I pulled myself around and thought, fucking hell. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got footballing legend Paul Gascoigne. Hi, mate. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Paul. How are you? Yeah, I'm all right. Not too bad. The thing is, I think everybody else, you know, with regards to uh, coronavirus. I mean, I've got the virus, but I've got the corona in the fridge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, it's all right. Not too bad. Just yeah. kicking along. Yeah, it's a weird time for everybody. It's just got to keep your head above water. But you're looking well, keeping fit. Yeah, I, was, oh, yeah, I did some training for a few weeks. Morning, night of the health form, and I was going to go back. The the spa, but it was uh, of course because of the virus they've had to shut it down. So really, just doing it, the odd bait work and the odd pull ups, a few sit ups indoors. But off from that, nothing really. Yeah, but at least you're doing something. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. trying to keep busy, really. Yeah, absolute honour to have you on a day, Paul. You're an absolute legend in Scotland, England, everywhere uh, around the world, basically. So yeah, it's good to get you on, get you through your story, and understand you a bit more. But I always go back to the start for my guests, where you grew up and how it all began. Well, I come from my mum's vagina, <laughs> and then. Um, no, nah, <laughs> yeah, I grew up in a small little village in Gated. Well, Gated, but the little village Dunstan. And then, um, I mean, when I was seven, we used to have like, we had loads of boys' clubs. One was Regit Boys' Club. I mean, like, sure, I went to Wall's End Boys' Club and Ian Bogan and a few of the other players, like Lee Clark and um, Carrick, went there. But I went to Regit Boys' Club and then my dad used to walk us, it was a couple of miles. Used to walk us there, and I used to jump over the wall, and then my dad used to nick to the pub for a couple of hours, and then I, I used to do there. We played like football, table tennis, and I went there every day, you know, every night. I went there, and uh, you know, when my dad first bought me football when I was seven, first leather football, I just kept it. I slept with it, I dribbled it everywhere, I dribbled it at the school. I used to hide the ball and then dribble it all the way back, just non-stop playing, you know. And um, and then obviously I used to watch the old match of the day. 
I think the first one I really watched that stood out was the Young, young Cruyff turn, and I, I mastered that. Um, and then I just obviously just, you know, I used to love school, and more because of the the, the, the PE lessons and obviously um, play time. And I used to just play constantly play football. Yeah. You know? So your passion came through straight away as soon as you got a ball. You just basically became in your blood that yeah. football was where you wanted to go. Well, my mum said I used to kick a little tennis ball about when I was three all the time, non-stop. Um, but when I got that first football, I just fell in love with it, you know. I was just constantly playing football. Who was the player you looked up to at Newcastle at that time? Um, I didn't really watch much of the, f the football at Newcastle. And I, I remember everyone was raving about Super Mac, um, how quick he was and a great uh, forward. Um, you know, and I, I always remember the same Willie McFall. I went to watch Willie McFall when he played in Ireland, I think it was. And they were going to sign him, and he let seven goals and they still signed him. <laughs> but m mostly, I think, you know, growing up, um, it was this, all I ever heard was, was um, obviously the th three was Jackie Milburn, Joe Harvey, which is a great, who was a great support of, of me. Um, so it was uh, Jackie Milburn before he passed away. Uh, but then Matt, Matt, Matt Don was the main man, wasn't he? Yeah. Just growing up and that, but I never got to watch any of the games. But when I got a bit older, I think it was 16, when I was a ball boy a couple of times. Did you, did you always dream about, because I know I've seen some of your documentaries and you always dreamed about playing at St James's Park? Yeah, I, I always remember, because we, when we moved from where I used to live, we lived miles away from the stadium. And I, could hear this, I could hear the crowd singing when I used to play football outside. You know, and I always thought, oh, one day I'd love to play for them. And it's just when I was 16, my mum had four jobs. My dad was working as a hod carrier in Germany and that. And when he come back, I said, and I just said to them, when I was just about turning 16, I said, well, I'm going to make I'm gonna make a professional football. And I'm going to make sure you used to never have to work again. You looked after Yeah. Yeah, and my fucking dad's passed away and I'm still looking after him. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the way it feels, but... Yeah, and then, you know, the, the break come through when I was given an apprentice, two-year apprentice, you know. So I knew when I left school, I was going to go straight to a job, which was something I loved, the yeah. football, you know. I know you lost your friend, Paul, when you were 10 as well. Did that play a big part in your life? Could, yeah, more like ticks, more than anything. I ended up with loads of different stupid habits. Like, one was like a pigeon noise. I used to go, mm -hmm. and I remember getting kicked out of the assembly for that. And then I'd stop that one and go into another twitch. And I had that for a, a couple of years. I couldn't get rid of it. Um, I remember once in the uh, yeah, well, I had one where we moved my neck. And I remember getting this girl. She's really nice. And I got a number before I went to the World Cup. <laughs> I think it was after the first game. She went, what's wrong with your neck? <laughs> I felt embarrassed. I went, oh, nothing. She went, I don't want to go to you anymore. So that was a really one day. <laughs> yeah, but I ended up with, for about three years, I couldn't get rid of them. It was a nightmare. Um, yeah, it was a shame because his mum said, you know, uh, two brothers, Steve was my age and he was eight. Steve was eight and Keith was 10 my age and I used to go with Keith and Keith didn't want to go because Steve was going. And mom, it was his first time at the Reggie Boys Club. He said, look after him, I says, I will. And um went to the shop and then we come out of the shop and start running in front of an ice cream van. He was one yard in front of me and he got hit. He must have went about 30 yards. And then I ran down and the, the guy in the car stayed in his car and he was about 20 yards away. And, I put him on my lap and his lips were moving. I thought, oh, he's okay. And that was it. That was his last movement. Um, and then I was, went and stayed in the bedroom where the coffin was. Uh, that was hard. And then Keith made us pick him out the coffin. And I was only 10, give him a kiss and that. And it was horrible. And I ended up with loads of ticks for a few years, you know. Yeah. But then, looking enough, they went away. Yeah. It must have been difficult then going through that, Paul, because it's not like now where people can... A lot of people most speaking out, and there's a lot more help. For you going through that trauma at 10 years old, do you think that can affect you why the addictions as well come into play? At the probably. Later on uh, in probably life? Probably, I would think so. I hope so, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I did, um, yeah, you know, I, I didn't, I mean, I didn't start smoking. I was like 30 odds. Um, and I learned about cocaine in rehab, because I thought, oh, what does that do for you? And I thought, <laughs> oh, I'll try that when I get rid of leave the drink. <laughs> Uh, which I did do, and then obviously my dad got me help. I went, got us put away for 11 days, and I learned to bear with it, and um, you know, I never bothered with that since. I mean, I went psychotic, it was horrible. Uh, I had it for a couple of months, I thought it was never going to go away. Um, but when it went away eventually, um, you know, I was pleased about that. But yeah, I mean, my first day, me, you know, I always wanted to score the Gallagher at the end, and it did happen, you know. Um, I remember when I, I can't remember, I come inside once. I think it was uh, Dan Jackson who played the Tibbers. And then uh, I 
I pretended to shoot both of them inside and hit the stanchion. So, you know, then I jumped on the fence. It was brilliant because some of my friends were in, actually in the crowd. And, you know, I used to go to them. Well, I was only on 25 quid a week. My mum was on 30 quid a week. My mum was on 25. And I says, Mum, no. So I should be on 30 and you 25. She went, no, I've got the dogs to feed. So we were getting beans on toast. The dog was getting filled with steak. <laughs> <laughs> but going to the games, I used to... Um, you know, like I'd be playing against Man United, I'd be on the bus with the fans, and they didn't know I was playing for Newcastle United. And I was mm -hmm. sitting on my own playing for these shortly. And I was only after, then after the game, I'd get on the bus back back home. And I always remember the uh, one one guy just looked at us. He went, "Are you just been playing before for Newcastle?" And I put my head down a little bit. I went, "Yeah." He said, "Well, if you don't play better the next game, you'll be walking home." And I made sure I did all right the next game, like, but. Yeah, until I bought my first car, which was a three grand Mini, which was all right. Yeah, yeah I felt the bollocks then. Mm -hmm. What was it like signing for Newcastle? Yeah, it was good, you know. Um, you know, I was sitting there signing there, and I knew I was going to be getting paid for the next two years, so that was okay. And then I wasn't, I wasn't in, a, um, I wasn't in a youth team. Um, you know, I was always subbing that, and he would never play us. And um, I mean, my diet wasn't great. I used to like buy a pat of mint, so I was a bottle of coke and fish and chips at night. And then we, Jack Tron become manager, and he pulled us aside. I was 16 and a half, and he went, yeah, you're a good player. I says, yeah, I am. He says, how long you got in your contract? So I was cocky, and I went, two years. He went, you got two weeks, you fat bastard. <laughs> he says, so he, uh, lunchtime, he used to send us to the cafe, give us steak and jack potato and that. And then I thought, that's nice for him. And he says, right, you're getting picked up at six o'clock at night. And I went, what for? He says, you're going to be training with Brendan Foster, who's a runner, and he used to train the athletes. So every night, for a few weeks, I'd be training at six o'clock with these athletes. It was hard. And um, then I started training sometimes 11 o'clock at night, going for runs and that. And within a month, I was captain of the youth team, captain of the, the reserves, and then we, we played in the Youth Cup final. I scored two, won 4 0 against Watford away. And then he came to the dressing room, and she pulled us aside, and says, uh, Right then, you come with me tomorrow. I said, what for? He says, you're going to be playing against Ipswich. I panicked. I says, no, I don't want to, I want to go back and celebrate with the lads. And so he says, OK, then I'll play your next game. Um, and then obviously, you know, I, he, I remember sitting on the bench with him. It was so, so, it was so funny. And he was sitting there, and Jack was brilliant of his. Um, and he was sitting there, and he went, uh, the, the fans started singing, uh, Charlton out, Charlton out. And he looked at us and he had a little cigarette in his hand. And he went, do you think I need this, Gaz? I went, not really. He went, see, I could look with your career and fucked off. <laughs> that was him. he gone. And I remember going to the dressing room half time. And the players went, where's Jack Tolton? And when he's left, he went, no, he hasn't. I went, he's, he's went home, he's had enough. He's quitting. So the team went out and that. And um, I think we, we, we beat Sheffield. I think it was 1-0 or something like that. And then the next day, he was collecting his stuff from the office and he opened the window and because uh, we won the youth cup and I was on 25 quid a week and he went guys come up so I went upstairs and he pulled 120 quid out of his pocket I went oh that's good and he gave us it and he went cheers so I ran downstairs I was so excited 120 quid and then he opened the window he went 10 pound each for all the players and I went oh shit okay then I kept it I think <laughs> um, and that was it you know um, but uh, yeah so you know I remember the first three games for Newcastle was like Liverpool, I got 10 out of 10 man of match. I was only 17. Then Man United, I got man of match. I think that's when Fergie fancied signed us. And then the other one was Tottenham, I scored two. And I remember going home and I said, Dad, when are you going to come watch us play? He went, when you made it, son, you haven't made it yet. So he sort of grounded us straight away. Oh, God, I've just been man of match three mm -hmm. times. I think he used to watch us in the workmen's club. I used to go after the games and that and then go and watch myself play on match of the day. Did your dad used to get nervous watching you play? Nah, he didn't give a shit. Him. Um, he just, all he used to say is get buckled in, son. You know, get stuck in and that. I said, I will do. Um, I think it was just, more, mostly when I was at, played for Tottenham at Wembley, come a couple of games, but when, he, when I moved to Italy, come watch us. You know, he enjoyed that. Who was it then? Man in a match for a couple of games, scoring goals. I know you used to get nervous before games. Were you nervous then or were you fearless? Fearless, I didn't bother, you know. I just used to play with a smile on my face and I never argued with any player. I used to talk to them more than anything else. And my opponents, I used to talk to the living daylights of them. I remember Roy Keane once. I just talked to him all the time because I said he was a new kid on the block. And I remember going down the tunnel and I said, Roy, 
He's like, you're the new kid in the box. Welcome to your worst nightmare. And I won one nil, but he said afterwards in the new... In the papers, he said, thank God that game's over with. He says, I've never been talked to so much in my life. I used to say, I'm, 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 I'm sleeping with your wife. I said, I'm not even married. I said, she's in the stands looking at us. And he'd look up and I'd run away with the ball. And I, I did the same with Robbie Savage. But nah, I used to just love it, you know. Um, because, you know, you train all week. And then you look forward to the Saturday. And I would never get nervous on the Saturday. Because I watch sometimes the football today. And I see like a centre-half come. He's got loads of space. And he just smashes out of play. And I think, what do you do that in training? In training, he'd probably bring it down and thingy. So I just enjoyed it, you know. I never, I never, I like, when I got beat, I never cried. When I won, I, I sort of, I was in tears when I won because I felt like I achieved something. And I've always yeah. been the same in any sport, like, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, I just, and then I just got more confident and confident. I think then first, you know, when I got my first goal or not, and then played against some of the top players like Brian Robson, Peter Reid, um, some of the top players in midfield and that, and I was getting the better of them. Um, the second game I did with Brian Robson, he hammered us the first. I remember playing against him in Newcastle at United, and Man United, and he scored a penalty, and he walked past us, and I just looked at him, and I went, great penalty, Brian. <laughs> and he went, you freaking idiot. <laughs> and I went, oh, that's okay. And then I went with the home game against, that was it, um, Liverpool, Kenny Daglish was at the front post, and I went and stood next to him, and I was just told him, going, Wow, you're Kenny Daglish. He just like looked at us, sort of smiling. I was just told them, just like, God, I was in all these people, not knowing I was like, so I forgot really I was in a game with them. I just tried to enjoy it, you know, and get mm -hmm. on the ball as much as possible. Yeah. What game was it, Vinny Jones? Was your very first game, Vinny grabbed your balls? Yeah, the Wimbledon way. I just remember being in the dressing room. Was he a tough bastard, Tim? <sighs> yeah, he was a hard bastard as well. I was just in the dressing room, and the manager, Willie White Falls, says, Peter Beasley up against. Gale at the back, be careful, use his elbows a bit, and he's a, he's a tough guy. And he went to Glen Road, up against John Fashion, who uses his elbows, be careful, you know, he's solid. And he just looked at me and he went, Gaza, good luck. And I went, what do you mean, good luck? He went, he played against a guy called Vinnie Jones. He said, I don't know how he can play, but I've heard he's a hard case. And he, I says, well, I recognise him. He said, I think so. And the man would come out the dressing room, and I'm walking down the tunnel, and I just see this guy with muscles. Jesus Christ, and the veins in his neck and his skin head. Oh, and that's got to be him. And I, I, I tell people, I'll see if you want to go back and dress him and say, Gaffer, I really don't feel too well today. And fucking, <laughs> so I, I went over to him and I just went, Hi, Vinny. And he went, Mean you fat bastard. And I just shit myself. I went, Oh, fuck, I mean, 90 minutes of this. And I always say, you know, I tell people, when I went on the pitch, you know, like they say, there's 88 minutes and you ask the referee how long to go and you say a couple of minutes. I asked the referee after two minutes how long to go mm -hmm. and he just looked and smiled and went 88 minutes and I went, oof. And it just felt, he followed us everywhere. Everywhere, you know. He just wouldn't let us go. And he was like, just fucking come on, man, you fap. I just all through the game and he was screaming loud and the fans could hear him shouting at us and all that. It was quite embarrassing. I managed to put the ball through his legs once though. Seen that? I've seen the video. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, and then afterwards... <clears throat> I come friends with him. When I signed for Tottenham, I actually come friends. He was the first one to turn up the hotel. And I remember sitting in my room and the phone went in the reception. It says, I've got a guy here to see you. I says, oh, it's okay. Who is it? They went, Vinnie Jones. I went, oh, shit. Tell him I'm not yeah. <laughs> and they went, no, he's just waiting for you. So I went down and become good friends then. You know, and... Uh, he still speaks very highly of you. Yeah, aye, Vinnie. I bless him with his... Tanya, he was, he was a great woman. <laughs> but yeah, he's always been supportive of Vinnie. Yeah. yeah, doing well now. He says not a drink for about seven years. Yeah, good man. Yeah. What about so when you were obviously the young kid from Newcastle eating your minstrels and chips to then getting shot into superstardom because everybody at that time in England was speaking about you as, as the next hot prospect. How was that mentally for you? It was okay. It then? Well, it was typical in my hometown because I couldn't go anywhere. You know, at eighteen and that, and all the lads I used to go out with the lads and that. And when I was like playing at Newcastle, I go nightclub and I got pestered a lot. Um, the fans were brilliant towards us and that um, you know I got pestered all the time non-stop I remember giving a sponsored car the, the, the garage gives a sponsored car put my name all over it and put the, the number of the garage on the side of the car and everyone was ringing up the garage to say Gaz has just crashed the car Gaz in the car crash and they used to ring us up and say you're in the car crash no man so I eventually had to give them the car back and it was just you know when I I got wind I really wanted it because we're would say um, we sell Chris Waddle. I was a bit gutted of that, and then I, 
I remember I pretended I was my own agent and wanted to try and sign for West Ham years when I was 19 or something. And then I was just Jack John, I think I was 19, and he said, I've got a contract for the sign. I said, well, I need to think about it. He said, no, you, you sign it. So I shipped myself and I signed a four-year contract. So I thought, oh, yeah, for four years. And then they said, Peter Beasley, and I just remember seeing my dad, I'm never going to get anywhere. We still the two good players, great world-class players, to be fair. And he said, just just keep on playing. And the first one was a call from um, was it Kenny Daglish. And I remember looking at my dad, and I went, Dad, Kenny Daglish on the phone. He said, talk to him then. And I spoke to Kenny Daglish for half an hour. And he, my dad said, what did he say about dad? I didn't understand a fact <laughs> what he said. So that deal was out of it. Yeah. And then a couple of days later, I was Sir Alex Ferguson, and he wanted to sign us and that. And he says, I'll go on a holiday. He let me sign, and I thought, Dad, Man United. And I remember that full day, I was so excited. I'm fucking joining Man United. I'm going to go. Um, Newcastle wanted 2.2 million for us. Uh, Liverpool were going to pay 2 million anyway. And um, Fergie says, well, I'm going on holiday. So when I get back on holiday, will you be at Old Trafford? I said, yeah, definitely. So I put the phone down. And I'm saying, Dad, fucking Man United, I'm going to be playing Brian Robson and all them top class players. I said, wow, this is good lad. And then I think the next day I went, the phone went, and it was Irvin Scholar. And he says, well, aren't you saying for Tottenham? I says, oh. And I thought, Tottenham, Man United's team. And I said, nah, I'm going to sign for Man United. He says, well, we'll buy your family, your parents a house for 120 grand. And I went, hold on. And I looked at my dad, I went, dad, they're going to buy your mum a house for 120 grand. And my dad went, well, what the fuck are you waiting for then, son? And I went, okay, it looks like I'm going to sign for Tottenham. And then my sister wanted a son bed. But then when I went to Tottenham, I mean, when I spoke to Terry Venables, he says, look, you sign for me and I'll have you playing for England within 10 games. And I always wanted to play for my country. And uh, I did it in 80 games, but he was brilliant, you know. Terry Venables knew when to... He was clever, because if I was having a good game, he'd tell us I was playing crap. Mm -hmm. So, like, up my game even yeah. better, you know. How do you think, looking back now, is there any regret from joining Tottenham or not Man U? Well, that, that season, well, I think the season we won the FA Cup final, obviously I'd only last 12 minutes, but... And we finished higher man. Right? It was only till the season after when brought on like Scholes and Becks and Giggs and Neville's, all them come through, you know, and they were an unbelievable team. Um, but we beat them a couple of times. We beat them. We drew away and beat them at home. Um, I remember I scored at home against them. But yeah, when you look back and that, you think, well, I wonder if things would have been different, because I thought get to London. And I'll be all right, you know, big London, big massive place, lots of famous people, so they wouldn't, I wouldn't get bothered as much. Well, you always want out in your castle, Paul? No, really, just because I sell Peter Beards and Chris Waddle, and if you want to be a great player, you want to play with the best. Mm -hmm. And I got the home that to sell them, you know, um, and I just thought, well, we're not going to go places. And we nearly got relegated that season. Um, I think I scored a few goals at the end of the season to keep me up. And then I just thought, if I go to London, there's not many, there's loads of famous people there, so I won't get pissed as much, which was ended up being worse. You know, the press were all over us, and I remember coming back from the World Cup, it was just mayhem. Um, so I didn't find it any, any, any better than I was being in Newcastle. But I loved it there. Tell you about, we had a great bunch of lads. Lineker. Great, great team spirit. Lineker, what, St. Paul Stewart was playing brilliant for Man City. You know, you had Paul Allen. Yeah, we had a good, good team, you know. How was it scoring that goal, Paul, in the FA Cup semi-final? Well, I, I played, um, it was the, the quarter-finals, and I, uh, in training, I did my hernia. And I went to Terry Reynolds, I've done my hernia. That was on Friday, just training. And I went, I can't play them, are She says, you've got to play. She says, I can't. He says, just get through the game. So I went, OK, then. So I went in, in the warm-up, and I did the other side. So I did double hernia, I couldn't even walk. So I went to dress him, I says, Gabba, can I play? You know, just no plays. He says, I need you to play. So he, um, he went and got the doctor, and the doctor gave us eight injections in my stomach and my thighs and numbed all the side of us. And I uh, gave the first goal away, and then we I set up the one to equalise, and then I scored the winner. And it was like 10 minutes ago, and the, uh, the numbness went away, and I just stood the off airline because we used the subs up. And I said to Terry Reynolds, I need, I need the operation. He went, you can't, we're playing. So he had a word with the doctor. He says, how long does a double hernia up take? And he said, six weeks. And we were playing Arsenal within four weeks. And I says, I'll do it for you. I'll make it for you, man. I just need this operation. So I uh, went to the hospital and did the operation. And I always remember when I come out the operation, the sedation, 
There was a nurse there saying, give us 10. I want 10 more. She went, sit-ups, you've got to do sit-ups already. So I was doing sit-ups straight away. And I managed to make it. And then I just heard, I think I was watching Tottenham Hotspur Reserves play at Luton. And one of the Arsenal coaches was there. And uh, I don't think he really knew. He was just talking away. And he says, are you going to make the semi-finals? I said, nah. I just said no, you know, to them. And he went, oh, we've got our suits ready. So uh, that was my jail for the lads. I went, lads, these bastards have got the fucking suits ready for the semi-final, for the final. So obviously the free kick come, and I just I remember looking at this, how far away it is, and I thought, oh, I don't know about hitting it for me. And then Gary Lennon could run past us. He went, hit it. I went, I'm going to with him. And um, yeah, I caught a belter. And I, as I always say, Dave Seaman was a daft shit. He tried to see it. <laughs> he made himself look like a nugget, you know. <laughs> But yeah, it was the celebrations afterwards, and not that, but just, just on the bus, because we went back to watch the other same final the White Hart Lane, and on the bus going back, we were just buzzing. It was, it was yeah. an unbelievable feeling like I'm going to be playing in the FA Cup final, because that was my dream. When I was growing up, my dream was to play in the World Cup. I was always to walk up them steps at Wembley. That was my dream as a footballer, because you see, I used to watch the FA Cup with the Rumps to it, and then the Cup final, everyone on the bus and that. I always want to play in the FA Cup final, and, and to miss walking up them steps was devastating. I mean, in the hospital, um, I was, I was crying my eyes out. I was gutted. Um, then at the celebration, I want to go, and he wouldn't let us go and join the celebration. I said, "Just cross me up, let's go." He said, "No." And then obviously got the operation done, and then obviously that was me moved to Lachu, which was had to wait another year, yeah. like, you know. But you were still young, Paul, even. How looking back now that managers telling you with a double hair there to still play instead of being a kid and taking off and wrapping you in cotton? Yeah, do you feel as if you were getting used a bit then? Yeah, I, well, you, you know, I wanted us to play in that and double hair, yeah. And he was saying, No, you'll be all right, you know. <laughs> yeah, fuck, oh, I couldn't even A walk. double fucking hair there? Fucking couldn't walk, man. Yeah. yeah. But nowadays, a lot of the players are getting well looked after, you know. Yeah. Um, on and off the pitch, more so than anything else. Um, you know, and. I knew a therapist that had come to Everton once. He was my, he used to be my counsellor. And we used to have one-on-one -on -one chats with him, and he was really helpful. And I said, he was, I said, did you speak to anybody else in the dressing room? You wouldn't think so. And he said, yeah, about eight players. So obviously, a lot of players had problems. He didn't say who, because he was confidential. But yeah, but nowadays, a lot of players are like, I think one space guy, it's brilliant. Well, he was a big guy, he was solid as anything. He was about six foot three. And I went, Are you the fitness coach? He went, No, I work for the club. And I said, What do you mean you work for the club? And he said, If any of the players, like any of the players' wives need shopping and I've got to look after the kid, I'd go do the shopping for them. So everything's done for them. Um, whether that works for you or against, like it wouldn't have worked for me. I like, you know, I like to be busy all the time. And like, they like, Stand on my own two feet, like you yeah. know. How was your sleeping back then, Paul? I know you struggled. Terrible. With sleep. Yeah, still now, you know. I, I think it was all because I used to love training. I had such a laugh in training. So, you know, I used to wake up at four o'clock and couldn't get back to sleep because I was so excited. I think it just stayed on there, like you know. I try and leave it as late as possible. Even if I went to bed at one o'clock, I still wake up like four o'clock, five o'clock. I'm terrible. Um, and I've, it's just stuck with us all the time, like you know. Was training football, just going to see the boys and, and working hard. Was that your therapy, just to take yeah. away from your method of thinking? Kind yeah, of thing? definitely. I, you know, you, some of the stuff you tell everyone what you got up to the weekends and had a laugh and that. Uh, Trevor Stephen was funny. You know, I remember once he said, "I'm putting something in the boot," and in, in his boot, he had a suit and a pair of jeans on the top, and then a different outfit. I said, why you got all these outfits? He said, just say, well, I'm going to go today. So I've always got something ready. If I'm going to have a dinner, so he was always prepared for him. Um, yeah, it was, I mean, football nowadays is completely different. I think it's got a lot to do with uh, the foreigners coming in. You know, they call it the English Premiership. It's not the English Premiership, it's a foreign Premiership. Yeah. You know, you see some some teams, top teams playing against each other. They've got two Englishmen in the team, like, you know, um, which is the same for our young kids coming through. I mean, I think... I think it was a pitch I seen about four or five years ago. Yeah, about five years ago. It was so funny. I think we might be in Colchester. You got Vardy and um Gareth Bale on the bench for his team like Colchester. So, you know, they did well to make it through. Mm -hmm. You've got some great young kids, talented, you know, which probably never get ever get a chance. Yeah. What was Gary Lineker like playing with at Tottenham? Yeah, he was funny. He's funny, you know, he 
for someone, because we signed him, and I said to Terry Benham, I said, what's he like? He says he's lethal. So I went, OK, no problem. And he hadn't scored for a few games. And I said to Terry Benham, I said, he said he was good. He says, he's crap. He went, give him time. And then he scored four goals that game. In Norwich it was. And he ended up scoring 38 goals. Um, but what a player I am. And I had to work out how he played so I could hit him every time with the passes, you know. And that went on to the, when we played for England as well. He used to like do a little movement with his fingers and that means he was spinning off. Or if he did that with his thumb, so you see it over the top. I knew he was coming short, like, you know. And he worked hard. He worked hard for the team. Oh, I'm so pleased he got the yellow card because he would have went through his career without getting it. <laughs> but we used to go like, but if we ever had a day off, like say it was Tuesday and the gaffer gave a Wednesday off, I like, right then. And I knew where in I lived, um, St. John's Wood. And after the train, I just get ready quickly, get in my car, fly to his house and put my car in his, his car park space and shoot off into London and stay the night. He couldn't park his car up. <laughs> so he used to leave it outside and get a, get a ticket. Uh, you get a ticket all the time and it was just one day Teddy Venom called us in and he says you've got to stop that fucking Linnick has grown fuming you keep parking your car outside his door I said okay no problem yeah Lynx yeah it was you know and it, it's funny because in training we used to do shooting practice he never did it he just used to go in he wouldn't do any shooting practice why is that? I don't know he just said he w- didn't want to take away for, for doing all that for when he played on the Saturday all he ever did was put the ball down do one penalty and then just go in you know um, but yeah, lethal it was. I remember when we signed him, I quite fancied him. He didn't got a hair on his body, and I remember saying, Lynn, are you like a fucking lady boy? <laughs> he, he just laughed. Yeah. He loves you to bits when you hear Lenny Carr or McCoy star Wayne Rooney speaking about you. It's like they glow up, they, 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 they become alive when they, they yeah. mention your name. Did have some laughs with him. You know, I just, sometimes training was hard, and I just thought, well, you know, I don't want to. I just. just I, I love training as well. I mean, I used to, I think I trained really, really hard for the team. And even when I played, like, you know, but I just, I just loved training. Like, when I was Everton, um, I heard that the, the ground staff played head tennis at like 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. So I used to get up at 7 o'clock and challenge them. They used to beat me with wellies on. And then I'd play with them for about an hour and a bit. And then I'd train and then I'd stay behind till about 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon playing head tennis with the, the ground staff. I used to love it. And then just head back home. I did that every day. Yeah, I just, I just loved it, you know. Uh, it was a great feeling being fit, you know, happy and fit. And not. And when I was, I was, I was, when I used to play the, um, for the first team, I used to go and watch a youth team play first at 12 o'clock kickoff. And Hot Colin Harvey was the manager. And there was, it was Everton on the 19s. And I was up in his office and he says, Gaza, What's this kid? And I says, How old is he? He went 14. I said, What's his name? He said, Wayne Rooney. And I says, He's on the 19s. He's only 14. He went, Yeah, put him on in a minute. And I think it was 20 minutes ago. And I put him on. Fucking hell, he scored two goals. It was incredible. So afterwards, I went to the dressing room and all the players were sitting there. And I went, Right, guys, well done. I says, I enjoyed watching that. I says, Anyway, I've got 40 quid. Is anyone going out tonight for a pint? I'll give you it. And Wayne Rooney put his hand up. He was only 14. Yeah. I said, he's got potential, him. Mm-hmm. If he follows me, drinking views, <laughs> he's got potential. <laughs> what a player he and, Yeah, up. he still owes us it. Yeah, and he's an unbelievable player, yeah. you know. He, he, didn't, he didn't look out of place. He trained with the first team at 14, 15, did not look out of place. He, he was, says you asked for the £40 back. Yeah, yeah. I keep asking for it back. <laughs> interest now to be a million quid. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, what a player he's went on to be, you know. He was fearless. Superstar. Yeah, fearless. Some of the goals he scored is just incredible. But you, you just think you just had that same kind of nature, you and Wayne Rooney, yeah, quite strong and mm-hmm. just running through people. Yeah. He ended up man you and England's leading top goal scorer, which is a phenomenal confident, achievement. Full of confidence. Hope he's as well as the manager, you know. Um, he's young, just starting out, and I think he started as a good team, Derby. Um, he gets some great experience yeah. from that as well, but what a player. Some of them goals he scored just not normal. His first goal for Everton, I think, against Arsenal. Yeah, incredible. 16. Just another ball. Yeah, good on him. Yeah. yeah, 16. What was it like, Paul, getting your first call-up for England? Brilliant. I mean, it was... Where was it? Was it? Yeah, it was Teddy Venables. And um, he pulled us in the office. I've got some news for you. And I went, what? You're not meeting... Obviously, you're not meeting the under-21s England squad. And I just went, oh, shit, never mind. He went, but you made the full squad. And I, well, I let up, you know. I have lumps in my throat when I talk about it. And I just remember going there. I was, and then I went downstairs. He must have told all the players. 
all the players gives an applause and shook my hand and that. And then I was uh, excited. And then um, I think it was sub for Denmark with uh, Tony Cotty. And we both got on five minutes or something. And then the next game was Albania. And he gave us 20 minutes and he went and gave us a goal. And I, I smiled at Bobby Robson. And that's when I scored, you know. The feeling's going for your country and the crowd erupted. Um, it was fantastic. And I just remember Sir Bobby's uh, interview afterwards. He says, we need two balls. He actually said in the dressing room, right, guys, sit down and listen. We need two balls, one for you and one for him there. And he just pointed at his leg to start laughing. And he went, get off the Mars bars as well. Yeah, I remember he told us to get off the Mars bars. I said, I will do. And I just, then I just felt, I was lucky because I, you look at the um, young players when they join the squad, all the other rest of the players are, are young as well, like you know, but when I, when I played for England, 22 and a bit, I was lucky because I had every player coming in the prime. So you had Shilton, you had um, Stuart Pearce, you had Terry Butcher, Wright, Mark Wright, you know, you had Gary Stevens, and you had uh, Chris Wall, John Barnes, Brian Robson, uh, Peter Beasley, and then I mean, that's some team to join, you know. So I, I just felt that, well, I'm just going to enjoy this. And I remember the f first time I was with Brian Robson, he said, Gaza, listen, any of the challenges, leave it for me. He says, I'll do the challenges you can't tackle. He says, I'm coming to the end of my career, and I'll take the knocks for you. And he says, any of the balls, I'll take the stitches. And for someone like him, he didn't have to say that, you know, and I just fell in over him. I mean, he's my idol, Brian Robson, I love him. What a player. I call him dog shit, because when he played, he was fucking everywhere, man. <laughs> everywhere. Yeah, he hadn't played against them. I just knew I was up. But I was lucky, because he never, he never smashed us in the tackle. Mm -hmm. He'd always be all right with us, because he could tackle, you know. But for someone to come back from three broken legs and still be the player he was, incredible, and he shot broken collarbone. Did you have many people try to protect you then, Paul? Then take you under the wing? I was wing. lucky, I mean... Was your head screwed on it, 21-22? Yeah, I definitely, I was full of confidence, but it, it taught them, in Newcastle, I had David McCree, who was at Manchester United at one time, so he did all my graft, really, and just when he won the ball, give it to me. And then I was at Tottenham, I had Paul Allen, and then I had Stuart McCall, so I always had someone solid in midfield with us. I remember the gaffer, his brother, he said, Paul Allen, he says, you do his graft, and when you win it, give it to Gaza and Gaza go for it if you lose it Paul make sure you're there to pick it up and give him the ball and Ollie, Paul Allen went okay no problem and when I was saying Ollie went I'm a fuck he says I'm not doing all the work for you I just start laughing I said that's okay I'll help you out man um, yeah so I was always had someone good and a hard grafter next to us you know which gave me the freedom to get playing yeah. like you know the 1990 World Cup Paul were you getting in that frame of mind that you were going to win it from the get go we were fortunate I mean we say fortunate we went there the greats Great uh, morale, the team was squad we had was, everyone was brilliant, you know, even the players that never got picked to play, they were fantastic. And uh, the good thing I think it was with us is Bobby Robson didn't ever watch anything that was going on back home, wouldn't ever read newspapers, just solely concentrated on the football, you know. Apart from when the, play, the Waves come over the semi-final, which I wasn't too happy about because we always get, end up getting beaten semis, but... Our team spirit was fantastic. We had such a laugh as well, you know. Um, when we were given a, a day off, we made the most of it, you know. And then when we trained, we put our heads, minds to it. And so Bobby was brilliant. Um, I remember once we, when we played Germany, we had a team sheet up. And then I got, put the team sheet over and put the, word, the war, right? Germany, the war. And put the sheet back down. And so we're sitting there, we're waiting for Sir Bobby Robson to come in. He says, right, guys, Germany, can you remember the war? Or we just start laughing our heads up. What he's laughing at? And then I went and lifted it up and he just shook his head, you know. Um, but for me, it was like when he used to do the team, when we used to say, right, then, say, for instance, right, we're playing um, Belgium. We want you watch Belgium against this other team for half an hour, see how they play. And I'm watching it for five minutes and I'm not giving a shit. So a Belgian player passed it to another player on the TV watching and I went, hmm. Mm, mm. And when I broke down, I went, mm. and then all of a sudden Steve McMahon joined in, and then John Bonds joined in, and it was about six were doing it, and Bobby Robson went fucking ballistic. He went, yeah, you'll be giving it, mm, 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 no, but when you get beat, you'll be going, boo, hoo, hoo, hoo. <laughs> he was just cracked up. Uh, I just never took notice. I wasn't bothered about the player I was playing against. I just knew in my own, my own ability, you know, that I could do the business when I, when I got out there, you know. Mm -hmm. I loved the World Cup. I told you about, you know, when I was at Reggie Boys Club, 
when I was young at seven, I took it the World Cup as if I was back at the boys' club, and I was playing table tennis. I was doing daft things. Um, I was playing tennis. I was on pedal boats. A slide yard co cocktail was the best. I said, I need a drink. Go have a drink. And I was a, a beach hut on a beach. And uh, there was no one about. So I went, oh. So one of the guys gives a pina colada. And he went, OK. And he gives a nice pina colada. And I'm sitting there. And I'm in, oh, God, I'm in a World Cup. The sun on the beach, drinking a pina colada. Fucking life. And I just said, Gaza. And I went, oh, fuck. And I said, what we lost? And he went, what you got there? So I panicked. And I went, I've got milkshake, gaffer. He went, give us a taste of that. I went, shit. So he had a taste. He went, ooh. So he said to the guy, can I have one of them? And I went behind, said, Bobby, I looked at the guy, he went, shit myself. <laughs> so the guy, looking up, the guy cotton done. And he gave Bobby Robson just a normal circuit. So he drank his a little bit with the straw. And he went, no, no, because it tastes yours. And he tasted mine. I thought, he's got me. He's going to send us back home. He had a taste of his. And then he said to the guy, he went, no, no, this is not the fucking same. And the guy says, what do you mean? He says, where's my umbrella and the cherry <laughs> and the sword? <laughs> oh, I get in, I thought, brilliant. Uh, he shot off and I uh, would never eat. Uh, and just fell asleep on the beach. Were you not playing tennis before the, the night before the semi-final yeah, as the, well? Yeah, the semi-final, I just room with Chris Waddle. And I said to Chris, I can't sleep. I said, God, it was like half past ten at night. So I went for a walk and I heard somebody playing tennis. And there was two Americans. And I just went in the court. I said, can I challenge this? I went, where's your partner? I said, no, I'll take the two years on. And I was playing for about 20 minutes. I was sweating me nuts off trying to beat them. And I just heard, Gaza! And I went, oh, shit. And he came into the tennis court. He walked past me, so I dropped the racket and ran like fucked in my room. And I could hear him shouting to the Americans, do you not know who he is? He's got the most important game in his life tomorrow, and you're playing back in tennis with him. So I ran the room, and I went to Chris. If anyone knocks on the door, just tell him I'm sleeping, I'm tired. He went, yeah, no problem, Gaza. Fucking hell, the door. He was, he was going to get broken in, man. Smashed. Chris went, who is it? He went to Gaffer. Where is he? He's sleeping. And he went, sleeping? He's been playing tennis for fucking half an hour. And Chris looked at me, he went, have you? And I looked, went, <laughs> fell asleep. And then I let that just come through the door underneath. And I was, I've had a look at it and he said, I'll see you in tomorrow morning. So the next day, I was like hiding from him because I didn't want to know if I'm going to play, I'll drop it, or he's going to drop us. And um, I was hiding. And then he just come round the corner. I always remember it was about half past eleven, taps on the shoulder. And he went, forget about last night. I've already called you after the brush. Last night wasn't normal. He says, but neither are you. He says, today you're playing against the best player in the world, Luther Matthias. And I looked at the gaffer and I went, I'm sorry, gaffer, but he is. And I walked off. And he went, come back. And I just kept on walking. And then I, I looked behind, he had his head to the ground, just shaking his head like that, saying, God, what am I going to do with him? But that was one of my best games for England. I know I got booked in that. The tears were more because I had such a great time, six weeks, you know, just playing, training and playing football away from every, away from the media, you know, just knowing the next morning I was training and the game coming up. Our fans were fantastic. And it was more like, I thought, I honestly thought that my career had come to an end then. You know, I felt like I didn't want to play anymore. Um, I felt devastated, the yellow card, obviously missing the final. Um, but the last 20 minutes, I gave me all, like, you know, for the players. Um, so sad in the dressing room afterwards. Uh, seeing the players and that, but then Bobby Robson picked us all up. I remember going back to the hotel mall, celebrating them a drink, and we decided to pick up Sir Bobby Robson and throw him in the swim pool. Because we had a, had a drink so much, we threw him up in the air and he'd come back, he'd come back down in the water, but the back of his head hit the back of the, uh, <laughs> the, dime, the dime board. I said, fucking, we killed him. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, he's coming back and it was a great feeling. That was a bit mm -hmm. of a shock for me coming back. Didn't realise that, you know, because... Like I said, during that World Cup, we never got to see anything. We never, we didn't know what was going on at home. weren't allowed to call the families after a game. weren't allowed. But I used to take my mobile into the into the shower and ring my dad. What do you think? Well played, son. Keep it up. Right, see you. I've got to go. <clears throat> but we did, did not have a clue what was going on. I think some of the other lads had played in other World Cups had a rough idea, but I didn't. Do you think that helps you? Because know, English media are quite, <coughs> are quite ruthless towards the English team and the English players that yeah don't. without a shot of a doubt I mean now and again <laughs> me and my mum I remember walking to the beach and that's when the, the waves come over and I was walking with Bobby Robson and the waves were ahead of him and that and he says uh, you're doing well son are you enjoying the World Cup yeah and then the next day some photographer took a picture from behind 
and said Bobby Robson can't take his eyes off the women's horses. Right, and he went off it. He, pulled, he always pulls me, he said, Gaza, come here. Can you believe this? Can you believe this? I was walking with you. They said, I'm looking at the girls' backsides. That's not me, is it? <laughs> and I just shook my head and laughed. Mm-hmm. And then and, and there was another bit. It was uh, Tony DeRigo. And his wife was lovely. And I remember talking to her and the press took a photo and they put it in the front page of the papers. Gaza's new blonde. I fucking hammered Tony DeRigo. <laughs> it was his wife. <laughs> and it was said, because it's new blood. Uh, and we ripped the piss out of him. And he, he couldn't handle that. He just, just stormed off to his dressing room, to his bedroom, like, you know, and I just knocked on his door and that. But, yeah, that was the only couple of times. Uh, but, yeah, I think it helped us a hell of a lot. Yeah. Looking Not, back in the semi-final, Paul, do you wish you would have took a penalty? Yeah. You know, my mind was just all over the place, you know. Um I just, I just couldn't think, and I was like, I was already down there, I got booked, and I was going to miss the final. But I just, I was coming in enough with the lads, like you know, um, to take the penalties. But I was just, I just couldn't, I couldn't believe it. Even the referee says, if we knew I had been booked in the first gate, but they've already had a yellow card, he wouldn't have booked us. But I still feel I didn't touch the guy um, with that challenge, you know. And I look back, it was, it's hard to take it. It's hard to watch some of the games. Well, not the games that semi final night, getting booked and not. Uh, but yeah, sometimes I wish I had took a penalty now when you look at it. Do you think you would have won the World Cup if you get through? Well, we're lucky because well, two minutes ago, Chris Waddle hit the post as well, like, you know. But I always say, I say on stage, Chris, Chris laughs. I say, you know, when we got back in the aeroplane and we arrived at Luton, I says, that's where Chris Waddle's penalty fucking ended. <laughs> in Luton. That was a terrible penalty, oh, man. hell, he went for <laughs> I thought he would have placed it. Like Stuart Pierce. He, I thought he might have placed it, but he just went for... Both of them went for power, you know? Nerves, though, eh? Yeah. Big stage. What and a I just, felt, I just felt with Shilton, I think, when I look back at it, I mean, we had Dave Besson, six foot six. I think with two minutes ago, we should have put him in goal for the penalties. Because when you're up against someone as big as that, you know, would have... I think he made the goal one because I felt, felt like I think some of the players did as well. When the penalty was taken, Schultz waited a little bit and then went for it instead of taking a gamble, you know. Yeah. But yeah, I was gutted because we're so close. Um, so it looks like Jeff Hurst is still making money off his hat trick yeah. for winning the World sure. Cup. <laughs> <laughs> How was it, Paul? Because that was you made it, and you were already getting a lot of press, but you made it into superstardom because you won. Um, BBC Personality of the Year yeah. as well, and everybody in the world then knew who. Gaza was. Yeah, I mean, how did that affect you, Paul? Come back, no, it was like it was okay. I mean, coming back, and then I all seen all the fans and that, and then I was like, I'd be on TV just talking. I'd say, oh, I think I might just take a guitar lessons, and I wake up in the morning, there'd be two guitars outside me the front door, or like I was given we thought the best dressed man in the country, and there was like dicky boat ties and suits outside me door, and I was given clothes, and you know, I was, I was on TV programs and. I remember the press saying he's doing too much, he's not concentrating on his football. And I went out that sat that was on a Friday. I went out and scored a hat trick past Peter Shilton on the Saturday. Um but it was, sometimes it was okay, sometimes it was scary. I just felt like I couldn't go anywhere. I felt trapped indoors. Um I mean the the, the public were fantastic towards us, but just wherever I went, you know. Um and then obviously then the press started. And that's when I found it really hard. Because the, the amount of lies the amount of lies that I had on us was just horrific, you know, I was just constantly telling lies and I felt like I had to defend myself all the time. So with football wise, that was me that was my outcome. I knew on a Saturday for ninety minutes I was free on that pitch. And you know, even they used to be hanging around outside the training grounds and stuff like that. So I knew for ninety minutes I would be free and that's when I used to really enjoy it, you know. And then obviously after the, the 90 minutes, as soon as I left the, dress, the, the football ground, then they were onto us, you know, so yeah. the followers everywhere. It was murder. I even, I, I'd be, sometimes I'd be in London and I'd see a couple of cars and a motorbike behind us and I'd have to ring up the police, pull over, police come up, block them in and make me drive off. And then obviously there was the phone hacking. But yeah, but I, I, I reckon I could have handled a bit better than I did because sometimes I did go over the top and drink too much. But I always performed on the Saturday, like, you know. Were you drinking heavy back then, Paul? No, not really. I think I'd drink, I'd drink on a on a Sunday, maybe on a Monday, you know, Tuesday just on the local pub. But like on a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I never, you know, I always f- thought of the football first. You know, I never wanted to let the lads down. It was just mainly when I left, I left football, when I, I quit football. Yeah. Is yeah. that one of the reasons why you wanted to go abroad? Is because to get try and get away from the media? Yeah, I thought if I go to Italy, it'll be all right. 
who I get away from everything. God almighty, I mean, 10,000 people at the airport. That, <laughs> that was scary. That they was, don't fuck about that, Italian fans. Hell. And I was at the airport and I was with my dad and I'm like, wow, dad, Jesus Christ. And then Johnny Ziggy and Augusto picked us up in the, in the car. It was bulletproof. And uh, it was funny, I was sitting in the back with my dad and I'm saying, fucking hell, dad, these are two big bastards. And uh, he says, yeah, the big fuck, I thought the son. And I says, well, I wonder what they're like and not. And then we got out of the car and the two of them spoke perfect English. I went, oh shit, dad, they understood what was said. So the, the first night, I went into the room, I had these two bodyguards in a connected room next to us. And dad was in his room and I'm in my room. I said, dad, I'm just coming along to see you. And I opened the door and there's a guy outside my door with a gun and chest. I went, oh shit, and I shut the door. I went, dad, you come to me, there's a guy outside. And I heard my dad open the door and I heard him slam it straight away. He went, there's a fucking guy outside my door with a gun. So I went, okay then. So when she met up and we had a couple of drinks down, this, down at the bottom, I had 22 bodyguards. They were sitting in trees and everything. And the, the, um, at night time, I had this habit where I used to go to the toilet and I used to touch the door a couple of times, door handle. And I went to the toilet in the dark, it was two o'clock. And I touched the door handle. Next thing I know, I've got someone with a hand around my neck with a gun to me dead. I went, whoa, 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 put the light on, it's Gaza. And it was a ghost story. He thought it was somebody else breaking in to get us. I'm fucking hell, I shit myself. And then it was the next day, and I says, right, don't wear suits, just wear casual gear. I don't want to, I wouldn't want to bring all the attention and that. So they just wore casual stuff and that, and just become really good friends with them. I learned my Italian from them, you know, and I started to enjoy it. It took us about three to six months to get used to the train. The training was rock hard. Wow, it was solid. Um, but then I started to get fit and started to enjoy my football until... Obviously, I broke my fibula and tibia, which was a bit of a nightmare, especially after I just come back after the ligaments and my kneecap. Um, but I got through that and I just thought to myself, well, how long am I going to be out? And it said about a year, nine, nine months to be year. So I just, you know, waited till I could start training on it and just went mad training, really, you know, doing. How swimming. hard was it, Paul? I know you said playing football was your <coughs> freedom, your getaway. You felt as if the shackles were off. How hard was that then when you were 9 1 on the sidelines? How did you deal oh, with that? Nightmare. It was a nightmare. Um, I mean, I, I couldn't do anything for three months. So I used to just like sit on the settee. Um, I was not the best of sunbathing. So I used to just really just sit on the settee and just have a few, drink more than I should have done, really. Just used to drink, just pass the days ahead. And then when he gives the. And then. We had a coach called Zemin. So after in England, after a year of getting fit, you, you start playing. In Italy, it took us about nine, ten months to get fit to start playing again. And he made us train for six months before playing us. And that was like hard work, that training and that. And eventually I had enough and I just said, look, I want to start playing. So I started playing and I think once I got the first tackle out of the way, then I felt okay, you know. And I started joining me football, I started scoring goals against Milan, scored some great goals. Yeah, I know it was tough over for you as well, because I think it was your PR or your manager was following you about for two years while doing that. She was writing a book and fucked yeah, you over. Yeah, she nodded, yeah, terrible. She was like, could she speak Italian? And they, they hired her to work for us and not knowing that she was writing everything down, you know. And she was getting on my nerves and that, and I said, I don't need you to work for us anymore. And obviously then she come out with a book. Did you struggle with uh, trust issues then, Paul? Was basically yeah, I did. one I thing mean, after another? Yeah, I mean, at first, I mean, what, what started, I think, more than anything, after that one, and then obviously my phone getting hacked off the news of the world, and I remember telling me, I only spoke to my family, but it was kept on coming out in the papers. And I, I eventually didn't speak to the family for three months. I said, you were speaking to the fucking papers, man. I'm only speaking to you, and then... I went off the rails a little bit and then when I found out I was getting hacked that was a big relief and then I started speaking to the family and apologised to them and then it was 12 years from the Sunday Mirror and now I've just been I'm in the case at the moment the son have been hackless for 12 years but the trust one yeah you know when you get because I'm, I'm I think I'm a trustworthy person person myself and a generous guy I, I think everyone's the same you know which yeah. is not the case but yeah, the trust thing is a big thing with me. Yeah, it must be difficult because the media kill people. Do you know what I mean? The, the, what mm. they're doing, especially if you're getting your phone hacked, breaking up with your family, your family's all you've got. That's the only people you could probably yeah, have spoke to to kind of balance out the demons. But if you are become constantly paranoid and they're pushing you to the edge, that could be a big part of why you wanted to drink as well because you yeah. probably thought you never had anyone. Well, either sleeping got terrible. Couldn't hardly sleep. And I just thought the drink would help to sleep. And obviously that progressed and got worse. And then obviously time in the treatment centre. 21 days which was okay um, I remember Brian Robson 
when I first went on. I was supposed to be in 28 days, and I went after three weeks. I said, Robbo, get me out of here, Gaffer. Honestly, I'll be all right. I don't want to drink again. I swear, get me out of here. She says, I'll come and see you then. And Brian Robson went to see the council. I was funny. He come back out. He said to me, he says, fuck me. He says, I think I need to be here as well. <laughs> and I just started laughing. But then I got back playing with Middlesbrough and got promotion. And things started looking up again. And then um, then I got the phone hacking. And I was just, you know, I was just off and on. You know, I didn't want to drink. But then obviously I'd become an alcoholic and admitting it. You know, I haven't been the best. I mean, I know how to keep still. I know how to stay sober. I know how to drink. You know, I did have spells of five years and four years. Last year wasn't brilliant. Um, just hope, hopefully this year will be a lot better, you know. Yeah, to, this year's a new year. It's only We can only go from today and move on for the future. We've mm. all got a past, Paul. We all fuck up. Yeah. Nobody's life is perfect. Like People can always say things and there's always going to be outside noise, but nobody, everybody's got demons. Everybody's got issues and people can understand that mm. like, the trauma you've been through from a young age, the trust issues, it's fucking difficult. But when you talk about being free on the park and... The why you're so loved is because your vulnerability on the park, because mm. your greatness. And did you know how good you were? Yeah, I mean, it never bothers. I just knew. I mean, some of the things I used to do on a pitch, I didn't know I did them. And it was only till afterwards I'd watch myself and think, I wonder how I did that. And I'd look and I'd think, fucking hell, that's not normal, you know? Like, I look at midfield players today, and a lot of them are crab footballers. All they do is just go sideways all the time. I mean, nowadays, if you watch football, I think the goalkeeper has more touches than anybody else on the field now. You know, you never see a player, a midfield player, have a look up and turn and get at them, you know. It's always like passing and it's a lot of that just passing now. You never see anyone. I mean, Tony Greelis looks all right. He's doing well. Um, and, and like the guy who um, plays for Leicester midfield, I can't remember his name now, I just watched him last night as well. He, he's Madison. He's a good player. Um, Tottenham, he's having a bit of trouble with Josie Mino, Del Ali, whatever his name is. He's, he seems a decent player. But I reckon he's a bit cocky, but... There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I just, when I played and that, some of the stuff I used to just do, I, I just did it off the cuff, you know. Um, I just, I used to look, before the ball come, I used to have a look around the pitch and know exactly where every player was. I knew whether I hit them first time or I'd take a touch and then go for it. So, yeah, so, and then I would only be like, after watch, I'd watch and I'd think, how did I do that? And I'd look, like sometimes I'd like, I see like sometimes my mate, ex-mate, Jimmy, I just say, how do you think I did? He said, look on the table. I didn't realise I like three man of match awards. I went, I must have done all right. You know, and I remember Wallace Smith was the best because he always had control of his players. And he get, he sent us for two fucking head scans. And why? He says, you fucking good head scan. <laughs> and I used to panic going in that thing, man, in that machine. And I had the second head scan. And then he... Three days later, I waited for the results, and he said, I want to work with you. Fuck me, he took us up to his dressing room, and in his room, he's throttled his stranglers. And he went, you bastard. I says, what's the matter? He says, you're a genius. I went, what, what do you mean? He says, I've been told, I've just got to let you do what you want, and no fucker does that with me. He says, now I've just got to let you do what you want. And I laughed, I went, that's okay. He says, I'll just still do it on the pitch. And so I got too cocky and had a few drinks, and the next day he throttled us again. <laughs> um, he seemed a tough bastard. Yeah, he's, but, yeah, tough, but fair with it, you know. Um, How yeah. was that, Paul, coming from Lazio when you knew it was coming to an end? Because I know Chelsea, Aston Villa, and I think the Lazio manager says Rangers is one, and you're like, ah, no, I'm not going to Rangers there in the first division. Yeah. You thought it was Queen's Park Rangers? I thought it was Queen's Park Rangers. I went, I ain't going there. And then when he said, what, Glad as I walked out the door, he went, Glasgow Rangers, and I turned around, and I just went, get him on the phone. Get him over, I said. And so Walter, remember Walter coming over, and he says, uh, "Let me tell you about Glasgow Rangers." And I went, "Let me tell you what I've got in the fucking fridge." And we both had a beer, and I said, "I'm signing." And he put Dave Murray on. He says, "You love it. Yeah, the fans will love you." And I mean, I was, you know, when I played for Newcastle, you always got the Leasers and the Gallagher. They would sing Rangers. They would shout Celtic. And uh, I used to have a taxi driver. And he, he used to always tell us you should always go for the derbies. And it was only until I went up there and played them one. You know, I played in 11, unbeaten 11. I think it's scored three or four. Um, it was f fantastic. And when, you know, when I arrived at the airport and then arrived at the stadium, I went up to the, in the chairman's office at the ground with Walter and shook his hand and that. And he says, have you seen outside? I went, no. And I looked out the window, I seen all the crowd. And I went, wow. Um, so it was a great feeling. What was your decision to join Rangers? I think just because um, 
you know, when you when you look at um, when you played for your country, and then he, when you played for your country, you know, you put the, the players and what teams were. When I played for England, everyone seemed to be Rangers, like Terry Butcher, Chris Woods, you know, Ray Wilkins, all at Rangers. So I used to, in the World Cup, I used to give Terry, Venable, Terry Butcher a stick. Fucking hell, you're playing in Scotland, Rangers, shite. And he went, don't knock till you fucking tried it. So I gave it a go, and he, he was right, like, you know. You seem to play your best football up at Rangers. Yeah, I loved it. You know, I was fearless, you know. I remember the press saying I wasn't going to do well up there. And I just won everything, you know. I won medals with the players, I won players, play out with the year. The lot, you know. And uh, I was just really enjoying my football. I loved it. You know, I'd sometimes have, have, the, odd, have a, a, the odd half a logger with the gaffer like on a Wednesday, and that would be it. I remember once, it was on a Friday night, and I was at Cameron's house, and I thought, ah, it was seven, eight o'clock night, it was on Friday, and I thought I'd have a, a light shandy. So I remember the shandy. And I seen the gaffer walk past us, and I went, oh, fuck. And so I just thought, shit. So I left it, went to my room, and I went to, went in the dress, went to the, the, went to the ground the next day on a Saturday, and it was like 10 past two. So he got your kit on, ready for the game. And he went, come here, I want a word with you. And I went, oh, fuck me. And I walked out of the dressing room, because the older players going, eh-eh. So I'm like, I'm, I think that's OK. And so I went to his office with him, what was that you had last night? I was just, that just a shandy gap and nothing else. He went, what was it? Get back in there, take your kit off, put your fucking suit on and get the fuck out of my club. So I just giggled. He went, I'm fucking serious, do it now. I went, oh, fuck. So I went in the dress room and I've taken my kit off, my number eight shirt and that, and the players were like, what's happening? I went, I've got to go fucking home. So I put my suit on and all the lads were giggling a bit. I went, fuck, John, he's fuming. So I'm walking out the pitch, I'm walking out the ground and all the fucking fans are coming in. And guys, where are you going? Oh, I don't feel well today, guys. Gotta go home, I've got a stomach bug. Just fucking said that. And then I had to sit indoors for three days. And he says, right, you're allowed to come back to the club. I says, OK. And he says, I'll tell you when to fucking drink and not to drink. I went, OK, I'm sorry, got one. And he says, give me... So funny, he went... I didn't know, he went, get me a brace on Saturday. So I went, OK, then. So I went to the shop and bought a fucking brace. I didn't realise the brace was two goals. So I managed to score two. I managed to score three, in fact, it was against Motherwell, scored hat trick, so that was okay. Yeah, but I had such great times up there, you know, because I loved fishing, I loved the hunting side of it, and, you know, we was given enough time to do all that. Did you know how big the rivalry was between Celtic Rangers, especially yeah. when you played the flute? Fucking hell. When you I got mean, the death threats? Four. <laughs> <laughs> fucking Ian Ferguson, that was. He just said, you know, if you score, do the sash, you know, and what's a sash? He says that, and he showed us. He says, the fans that love it. When he said that, and he says, the fans that love it, and I went, ooh, I'll do anything for the fucking fans, me. And obviously scored against Stoke Bucharest, and I did it. So I, I scored, and on the way home, I told my dad, I went, Dad, get the papers, I'm on all the fucking back pages, man, I scored. Got man a match, scored. Stoke Bucharest, I said, fucking get the back pages, you, you love them. Give the papers to me mum as well. So I've got up, and I went to the fucking, I went to the papers, and on the, the side bit where you're selling papers, I'm like, fuck me, I'm on the front page, shit. I went, Dad, fuck me, I don't think I'm in the back pages, but I think I'm on every other <laughs> fucking page. The IRA are going to kill this man. And he just giggled. He says, you'll be all right. And then when I got that letter through, and I read it, and Walter read it, and I says, you think he's going to kill us? He said, I think so, fucking hell. And I said, get the police, and then the police come. And I says, have you seen this letter? Is he serious? I mean, the guy left his name, number, mobile, house address, and a lot. So he's going to kill us. And the cop went, yeah, he's going to kill you. So we went over and seen him. I waited two doors, two days. I stayed indoors, and I was shit myself. And um, the police come and I said, "Did you see him?" I said, "Yeah." And um, I says, "What's was he going to kill us?" I went, "Yeah." I said, "Fuck me, what are you going to do about it?" I went, "Nothing." I says, "Until he comes to the, our country, so we're not going to hang around the airport." So when I used to play, I used to look in the crowd and fucking look to see if anyone's got a gun and that. So it was, went on for a few months. I was shit myself, and then obviously I got a letter back from him. He says, "Okay, you've not." Don't it for a while, I'll let you go now. And <laughs> I could relax then. Like, and Fergie, I went, you stupid bastard. <laughs> yeah. yeah but they're giving you something to check under your car for bombs. Yeah, I'll tell you, the police come. So I say, six o'clock. And I says, what's that? He says, check under your car for bombs. I says, what, if the car starts up? He says, yeah. And I went, fucking hell. And uh, he says, be careful with your mail. If you open it, it could explode in your face. 
And I was like, really fucking panicking. So I used to get me mate, Jimmy. So Jimmy, go and take his, he drives into work. I'll just have a cigarette at the moment. And I used to wait for fucking Jimmy to start the car up to see if it blew up or not. I'd be, like, <laughs> I'd be like 300 yards away. <laughs> I'd be like 300 yards away. Mm-hmm. Gaza, what are you doing? I'll just have a fag. Start the fucking car up. Did you break into McCoyster's house? Yeah, I knew he kept his kitchen window open. And he used to, I used to have a couple of pints at the grave. Coyce used to go home at about 11.30. And I used to stay at the boot one But I knew my house was 1.8 miles from his. So I thought I used to walk home and set up for the taxi. And then I was walking. And I thought, oh, fuck, I'm starving. So I knew he kept his back kitchen window open a little bit. So I got in and lifted the window up. And I went inside and I started just making myself a ham sandwich. And the next thing I just see the light on behind us, we're fucking guys with a baseball bat right behind us. And he went, oh, it's fucking you. He says, I'll see you in the morning. I went, cheers, guys, I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> Climbed back up the window and fucking walked over the sandwich. That was hilarious. That. I mean, fucking hell, good job he didn't whack us with that stick. Yeah, club, because he said he heard somebody downstairs and that, and I was just making me savage. Fucking thought it was a weird house. And you bust into the dressing room, but you had two fish. I think you and McCoys were injured. Yeah, I was quite mean, guys were injured. And I'd been fishing and I got a couple of trout. I said, Guys, I've got these trout. Why don't we stick it in Gordon Drew's? Someone's car. He went, I've got Gordon Drew's keys. And I was there, we're all giving sponsored cars, like Dave Murray gave everyone a car with 17 grand or something. And so I put one in the boot. And Kaiser went, he's going to notice that. I went, I know that, that's all right. And I went inside his car and just squeezed it under the seat, right under the seat so he'd never find it. And then he got into, he must have smelt the trout in the boot. And he come to the dressing room with the trout, he went, Gaza, you'll never catch me out. I went, yeah, you got me there, mate. And but fucking two weeks later, he went, Gaza, I'm not being funny, but there's a fucking other fish. <laughs> and I went, no, there isn't. And then... I eventually seen it. I had to get it out. It was fucking stinking in his car. <laughs> and he tried to sell it. He couldn't sell the car. So he, he went to David with money and I had to buy him a new fucking car. So that show cost us about 17 yeah. grand or something. So I was good it. But yeah, I had some laughs with it. Why do you but think you played so well at Rangers? Because I know Durante, I've met him a few times and uh, Coy stayed there. Do you think it's because they're kind of the same nature as yourself? Like yeah. kind of up for a laugh and up yeah, for a noise I mean, up? I mean, I thought I was quite funny in dressing room with Durante and Coisty. I was up against it, you know. I remember, I would get my teeth done. <laughs> and I had temporary one, ones in first. And they were like, it hit me bottom lip. And Coisty went, fucking hell, guys. I don't think you need an apple through a letterbox. I was pissing myself. And anyway, you wouldn't told everyone. And then I'd be playing on the Saturday. And then the front pages, Gaza plays well with these new teeth. And I'm fucking God damn it. Um, but yeah, I was. I just think the morale in there, you know, and I was fortunate because I joined Rangers when we had 18 internationals, you know. That's an incredible low job. Kyle Steve, all of me, you know. Just felt sorry for Durant because I played against him for England on the 21s against Scotland. And I remember the papers putting saying Gaza against Durant. And fucking he pissed on us. What a player he was. Yeah, well, I thought, wow, that guy's an unbelievable well. player. Yeah, it's a shame a bad tackle. Um, but he, you know, for him, someone like that, morale in the dressing room was, was brilliant, you know. How was it going to Euro 96 with playing for a Scottish team? I got, got, Andy for, I got hammered for a few months of the players and we're going to stick it right up, you English bastard. And I just went to them, I says, look, you guys, I'm playing about, again, seven years, so I know how you play. You know how I play, but you don't know how, how I'm like when I play for my country. And to score that goal against Andy Gore, I'm fucking brilliant. And I gave him a quick look, a quick, quick glance when I scored it. And then I turned away and he was fucking, wasn't happy. And I enjoyed the celebration. And it was quite, it was all right, you know, I was like, I went on holiday and I, I wasn't thinking about it. And then about five days ago, to the end of the holiday, I went, oh, fuck, I've got to go back to Scotland, yeah. And I started panicking a little bit. But uh, the lads were brilliant in the dressing room. I used to do, I used to go like, I used to get a bowl in the dressing room and get a mop and pretend it was Colin Henry. And I used to flick it over the mop and then volleyed <laughs> past Andy Gorham and, oh, and then do the celebration. He, used to, he wasn't happy. But yeah, the guys were brilliant, you know. The um, team spirit was there. I've never witnessed anything like it. How was Walter Smith as a manager? Brilliant. I mean, both of them bounced off each other, Archie and, and um, Walter, you know. One would give you a bollock and the other G up, and one would give you a bollock and the other one would G up. So it worked on both favours, you know. The new went to uh, give you a bollock and the new went not to, you know. You've played in a few derbies, Paul. You've played in the Roma derby, a few London derbies. What's that compared to the old firm derby? Old firm is like more hatred more than anything else, but and see what it means to them. You know, I think it was different. And in Roma and Lazio, they just say Roma won the league and the cup. 
done the double, but Lazio beat them that season in one game. It felt like Lazio won the league. Where this one, you know, they're playing for the titles, you know. This nine in a row to get a match of nine in a row was great and get that hat trick was special. But yeah, it's more the hatred and it's not nice really for me because I'm like from Newcastle, but seeing some of the players, what it means to them in the dressing room, wow, mighty, I've never seen anything like it. I mean, John Brown, he was funny, he was freaking, he had to be at the ground for like, say, half past one or something. He'd be there at 12 o'clock with a brown bag lying on his back, <laughs> saving his energy. Fucking hell. I go, wow. And I smile at them, but. You know, before the start of it, you're not too bothered about it. And when you go out on the pitch and you hear the crowds and that, fucking hell, I mean, every fucking challenge, every pass is just like applaud or whatever, you know, the moaning yeah. and the groaning. Did what Smith used to give you the Wednesday off and every Tuesdays went out on the piss? Um, well, coming maybe sometimes in the afternoon, just have a light half an hour, but he knew what... He knew on a Monday we wouldn't train hard because he knew some of the lads would be, would be on the piss and that, so he wouldn't train as hard. And just, but then on Tuesday he'd run the bollocks off her, and then he'd give us a Wednesday off. Uh, but Tuesday something training was pretty rock hard, like you know. What was the game you were drinking whiskey at half time and you came out and scored two? Good final against Hodge. Were you nervous? No, I just fucking I was just sitting there and I had the first half wasn't the best and I had that row with Coisty, and I was just sitting. There, I said fucking hell, and I went sorry Coisty. I said, I had any problem. And I was sitting there, I said, fucking, I've got to pull my finger out. And then while Archie knocks, I went, are you a fucking drink? I went, no. I went, go and get one. I went, oh, okay. So I went to the boardroom, I had a treble. And I went, oh, here's another one. So I whacked that in. And he went, he had a drink now. And I went, yeah. He said, no, fucking go out and do the business. I went, okay. And I went and scored two in 20 minutes. But afterwards, we won the cup final. And Walter come up and he says, right, guys, we're going out tonight. Gaza, you've had your drink. You're fucking staying indoors. I went, all right then. So I went home and I was about 10 o'clock at night and I found out where the players were in the way, the, the managers and the wives. So I turned up the Indian restaurant, took my clothes up and danced on the table, bollock naked. <laughs> yeah, As you do. Yeah, as you do. <laughs> so it was a bit of a laugh. Uh-huh. But yeah, I had some laughs and, you know, but I was enjoying my football again. I, he said, what I said, it was, no, same for Glasgow Rangers. He says, well, have you... Great team spirit. If you want to be with the lads, they'll never be with you. He says, and um, you'll enjoy your football again. But people think it was hard, easy playing for Rangers. Was it fuck? I mean, you t- if I played for Kilmarnock and I'm playing against K- Rangers, I want to. I want to sign for Rangers. So I'll be working my nuts off to play well against Rangers. So the gaffer will pick me to sign for Rangers. Who was the best player on the team at that time? How was Brian Loudrop? He was class. Yeah, we used to pass each other and make noises. We, we, you know, he was. He wanted a few minutes break, just give him the ball, which is class. Koisty, his fucking finishing was incredible. I said, how do you fucking finish? He said, he says, you know, if I went for the top corner, I would never hit it. So I used to aim for the keeper. <laughs> and he said, go in the top corner. Um, yeah, well, I, was, I mean, George Alberts, fucking Bjorkland, he was unbelievable. You know, Andy Gorham didn't make mistakes for fucking years. I mean, the time I was there... Um, I was just unfortunate. And Stuart McCall could just run for fun, you know, and he got stuck in for a little player. Um, you know, so we'd, we went out there, but, you know, we had times of Walter Smith saying, right, and if you don't win 4 0 today, I'm running you on a Sunday. And he would. So, you know, you're under pressure. And he said, right, that's two. And I want another two goals. So otherwise, I'm telling you, you'd be training hard all week. So it'd be like, fucking, that's what it was like to play by Rangers. The Aberdeen game, you got a hat trick. You scored two world class goals, if I'm honest. And, I know you were going, you scored two, but then you get a penalty in the last minute and McCoy takes the penalties. Please. Yeah. How did, why did they give you the penalty? Well, he's, I come the penalty and I got the ball and Coisey went, I'll take the penalties, Gaza. I'm not fucking out, Coisey. I says, this is for a hat-trick, man. I win the fucking eight in a row. He says, yeah, but I'll take the penalties. I was fucking, let's take it, man. And he went, listen, I could be leaving at the end of the season. This could, he says, this could be my last goal for Rangers. So I went, well, if you fucking leave and fuck off, I'm taking this. Anyway, go on then. And so, luckily enough, I changed my mind because I always go to the other side and I actually put it that side, you know. Because um, I remember when I took a penalty against Celtic and I missed and I did that same penalty and the keeper saved it and I never go that side. I don't know, the last minute I just changed my mind, which I shouldn't have done, but it went in, looked fortunate enough. Um, and then, you know, I've never won a championship before, so that was my first championship. And in the, um, in the dressing room, I can witness anything like it. It was incredible. It was incredible, you know. Um, the players, you know, celebrating and stuff like that. And then you had a few tears and I didn't realise 
a well, few of the players had tears in eyes and obviously you won on why and then I heard like a lot of them was going to know like the, the next season was going to be their last season together really like Koshy was coming to the end of his time Goffey was Stu McCall was um, a lot of the players had all been together for so many years were going to be parting you know from a magnificent football club um, but yeah it was great celebrations I loved it Why did you leave Rangers Paul? Well I just heard Walter was leaving Walter Smith he just pulled us he said, I'm worried there's 10 games left. He says, I'm getting sat at the end of the season. And he says, they're bringing in the manager to go up the card. He's a bit awkward and the sort of person you are, you might not get on with him and you'll be stuck with him. He might not play you. Where Brian Robson, who's my idol, wants to sign you for Middlesbrough and go for promotion. And they're in the FA Cup thing and that. He says, why don't you go? And so I spoke to Dave Murray. He says, we're going to get the same money we paid for you. So I thought, OK, then I'll go then. I didn't see anything of the lads. And I was on the way, halfway there, I stopped, stopped crying my eyes out. And Dave Murray rang us. He says, look, uh, just turn the car around, come back to the club. And I'd already spoke to Brian Robson. And I st- sat there for an hour thinking in the, on the motorway. And I thought, I'll just go ahead with it. And, and I just carried on, went to Middlesbrough. Then obviously it was funny, because in the cup final, I can hear like one Paul Gascoigne. And I'm thinking, who's that? I looked at the stage, there was 10 of the Rangers players at the game, seeing one poor gas, it was funny. Was but that? then it was so weird to see them, you know. Like, you know, fucking one week I'm like with Rangers and then the next thing I'm in a cup final, which I didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy the game at all. And I felt out of place. I felt lost. And I just felt like oh, I shouldn't have left Rangers, you know. Do you remember that? Is that a regret that you yeah, should, massive, should have, yeah, have stayed? Yeah, huge regret, yeah. The Rangers Even, fans still love you, my uncle Jojo and my young cousins Dean and David love you to bits. That I've actually got a Rangers talk. My uh, yes, young cousin Dean's want to say that. Say um, but they, everybody thinks, even Greg gets here today, they just they fucking adore yeah, you. Yeah, I, I do venues when I go on stage around, all around England and that, and the, the fans are good. Fucking Rangers once, nightmare. I mean, it was one of them I did, and I was supposed to talk for an hour, the fans sang for 55 minutes. I had to get the men said, lads, I'm supposed to talk, you know. Fucking, that was it. I mean, I'd say, uh, um, you know, I'd just say, I'd be sitting there, and I think, right, I want to break from talking. So I'd just go, oh, the blue bells are blowing. And that's it, the fucking place erupted, you know. And then I remember sometimes I get someone to go on the stage just before me, and I was the next Everton captain, Johnny Young. I can't remember his name. And he says, I'm going on first do 15 minutes in you, Gaza. And she went on the stage, he's come back a minute later. He went, fuck that. He says, they bought me, they got booed off. <laughs> she says, I fucking never booed us when I played football. I felt so good mm-hmm. for him. Um, but yeah, the atmosphere when I do venues up there is, you know, I'm in for a good night, and, but the singing is just amazing considering I was there for two years. But, you know, I loved it, you know. I just feel like the person I am, I'm just like one of the fans, really. Yeah. Just, was it difficult, Paul, never being settled to a team for more than two or three years? No, not really. It's just unfortunate, like, We'd sell players like Newcastle. I was enjoying it with sell players. And then it was Tottenham, and it was only when Terry Burnham was says, Look, Lacho coming in, it's an opportunity. He says, well, When I was a manager in England, and I had the opportunity to be Barcelona manager, he says, I, I thrived on it. He said, I wanted to stay here, yeah, but he says, Opportunity to go and play abroad and learn, learn, play football abroad, you know. Mm-hmm. And I thought, Well, I'm getting hammered a lot in, in England because of the World Cup thing, and the press wouldn't leave us alone. I thought, Well, I'll give a break and go out there and play in the sun and that. It was just the same over in Italy, so wherever I went, like, you know. Um, but then, you know, after four years and that, and the new man's, I didn't like him. And uh, I thought, where well, am I going to go here? Yeah, and I didn't want to go to Chelsea because of Hoddle. I mean, Hoddle says, I found God. I says, that must have been a fucking great pass. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was like, I said, well, I didn't really want to go there. But, you know, the opportunity range, I didn't even flinch. I just said, yes, mm-hmm. within seconds, you know. And... You know, I wouldn't change it for the world. Yeah, I know the 98, you get dropped, man, that absolutely broke you. How yeah, about- it was it's terrible, really. I mean, I went out that night. I know for a fact I went out that night with Chris Evans. I went back to Chris Evans and there's someone took a photo with a mobile phone at 11 o'clock. I know that six of the England players were in sorts at six o'clock in the morning. Not one of them hit the papers. And that night, when they talk about in the hotel, when he let me have a couple of beers and that, I went to bed with Dave Seaman and Paul Lynch at 11 o'clock and the players were up till 5 o'clock in the morning getting pissed. You know, nothing, none of that was said. And I, it was a member, Walter Smith and Terry Venables has always said to us, I always remember they said, be careful with him, Gazza. You want to make a name for yourself. And when he dropped it, you know. 
and uh, even the players in the books when they're written the books and it was discussed and oh, I got dropped and maybe had a chance of winning if I hadn't played in it so it took us a year to get over that I was fucking distraught yeah. I was absolutely devastated you know and so you know I remember someone said you know in the World Cup 1990 make the most of it because it could be the only one and they were right mm-hmm. now the 94 I missed that because I broke my arm in a game and then the 98 won and then obviously just quickly like, you know how was it then when it was coming to end, did you went to, did you go to Everton as well after I went to Everton yeah I started enjoying my football I was getting man of matches at 35 and then I knew it was coming to the end of my career and that and then obviously started drinking badly and then Wallace sent, went to treatment and come back and started finishing off and playing really well and, and scoring goals and enjoying my football again like you know and then obviously David Moyes coming Wallace says he was leaving so I left I went to Burnley which was a bad move Did you have went anywhere Walter went do you think if he came in for you and it was at any team yeah yeah because I remember years ago when I was on holiday with my ex-wife and I see him on the beach and I said to my ex-wife I said see him over there so that's the man who's ever range as him I said I'd love to play for him it's supposed to be brilliant and then four years later I, I got talking to him having a few drinks and I was just and then eventually and playing but it was his son Neil he said Dad look at him. why am I going for Gaza he went he wouldn't sign for the Rangers and obviously I did you know as um you know, if I think of any any teams I'd, I'd love to play, go back and play for all, but Rangers be the one. Who was that in China? Horrific. I mean, I, <laughs> fucking hell. I was in the most, it was the most polluted place in the world. It was horrific. I mean, I thought I was going to be stuck there for life. It was uh, horrific. I mean, well, they never paid us. I was there for three months. I scored on my debut, but then I started getting paranoid and thought I was going to be stuck there because of, it was just one street I lived in. It was 100 yards long. And there was no one about, there's no shops. I mean, the, the barbers was a hut outside in the middle of the road. The dentist was the best. It was a chair with a guy with the pliers and the tooth. Toilet roll. They pull your teeth out and give me that one fucking hell. So my dad come over, Jimmy, I sent him back home. I said, can't stay here. He says, go back. And then I um, I was doing the Channel 4 documentary and I didn't look well. And they said, look, Paul, you better fucking get back home. And I went, okay. And I didn't see anything, and then the next thing I just got off the quickest flight and just was there for three months and then come back, like you know. Mm-hmm. How was it, Paul, coming to the end of your career and you know that you had to retire? Oh, horrific. Didn't oh God, I remember Kenny Dagley saying it was, you know, Paul, when you when you know, when you know you're going to quit, when you know you're going to quit football, um, like three years before, start planning what you're going to do when you quit. And I went, yeah, yeah. So I'm thinking, like, oh, it's okay, it's only three years. I wait, and then. After a year, there's two years left, and I think, oh, I've still got two years. Next thing I know, I'm I fucking retired. And I think, shit, what am I going to do now? Like, you know, you went from like, do, you know, you, every time you went to bed at night time, you knew you were doing something in the morning. Well, when you quit, you think, what am I going to do now? Like, you know, and I didn't really want to go into management. I did try it, Ketter manager. It's funny. The chairman says, Paul, get well to the third division. I did, I put them in the fucking fourth. <laughs> 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 but he wasn't paying the players and I used to speak to Alice first and I spoke to Walt I said just get out of there Walt I know she said not for you there was that a big void then Paul from no able to playing football to then is that when you started replacing it with drink yeah mm-hmm. I started having to drink badly um, it was more like the spirits really I was always drinking beer and that and then the spirits were the worst things and then you know I'd, like, I'd go for treatment and then I'd, I'd do all right for about four years and that and then I'd get bored and then it'd be like a couple of weeks binge and then I'd just go. But, I, you know, I probably went to rehab really badly for drink twice. I've never been for drugs. But I've went for Red Bull. I went for Calpol. Fucking that was funny, Calpol in America. Sitting there, what are you in for, heroin? What are you in for, cocaine? What are you in for, fucking this, that? There's a gas gun, what are you here for? Calpol. Fucking Calpol. Yeah, what's Calpol? I feed babies. Because I realised, like, Calpol has a 0.01% volume. So I used to like buy with 15 bottles and down them. So it'd be enough for a pint. And I remember I went to this chemist shop in Newcastle and I went into the shop and I went to home and I nine bottles of Calpol. So I guess I get out. I went, shh, don't tell anyone. I says, I've got three wives and nine kids. I've got to feed the kids. She went, fuck off out of the shop. I was bored from every chemist in Newcastle. <laughs> So, yeah, I went for Calpol, I went for Red Bull, I went for fucking just stupid things, really. And I just thought, you know, I'm just, just got to just get well again. So I just started training and, and then put, started playing golf when I come down here. Picked up golf, which is passing, and I got some good counsellors, Katie and Martin, the kids are helpful, 
you know, I sometimes go around there for a few days and just watch Netflix. Don't get fed, like. <laughs> yeah, they're that tight, they only cry from one eye. Mm-hmm. Katie's that tight, she only cries from fucking one eye, honestly. <laughs> How was it, Paul, getting into rehab for the first time? Is that when you admitted for the first time that you had a problem? I didn't really admit it the first time. Yeah, I, I didn't want to admit it, you know. I was only there for 21, I should say the 28. Eric Clapton come and seen us. It was so funny, he says, when I say 50 questions, he says, five and under, you're not an alcoholic, and five and over, you are. And I went, okay, and I'm fucking lying, everyone. So I answered the 50 questions. I come up with 35 fucking points, and that's telling lies. <laughs> so eventually, once I said I was an alcoholic, I still go to meetings. I like meetings. I haven't been for a while. But, you know, I just try my best, and, you know, sometimes I need to go to meetings. But sometimes the counsellors, I play golf with them, I go play snooker with them, and when I'm playing golf, I have a chat with them, how's things yeah. going, or the other person might knock on the door. Did you pass away, Paul, in one of the rehabs? Did your heart stop or something? Yeah, in America... I took a couple of seizures and took us in the hospital and the shakes were that bad that put me in a in, in coma. Um, it's like a coma thing. Induced coma for about 18 days. And then I woke up, uh, said inject my heart and lungs, keep us alive and that, and that scared us. I did all right, I stayed sober for five years. But I remember going back to the treatment centre and ringing home. I said, I'm ready to come home now. And when you've been in a fucking coma for 18 days. And I went, have I been in a coma? They went, yeah, I went... See you later. I'll see you in about five weeks and put the phone down. But I enjoy rehab, you know, when you're amongst other people and the same thing. But then sometimes it can be tough, you know, because of this trust where you've got to get everything out and sometimes, you know, you can don't want to. Uh, but I managed to do that, you know. And I did a book about it, one book of the year, and did another book of that one book of the year. So, you know, sometimes some things good come out of it. But I know when I'm doing wrong and it's not brilliant. I regret it after yeah, yeah listen Paul we all do wrong in life yeah. we all make mistakes and like, you're still here to tell the tale mm-hmm. that shows you how much a fighter you are I think it's not the drink as much it's the fucking consequences you know I and mean, sometimes my consequences are horrific yeah so how difficult was Paul to when you see yourself in the front page and back page when it doesn't bother us no you're used to it yeah you get so much used to it it's just a lies but, but the pressure used to put bottles of gin outside your house and then you used to pick it up and walk to the bin and they took photos yeah I used to uh, yeah and then I got sick of like people ringing you up, what you're doing, and fucking having to explain yourself all the time. So, like, I just changed my number for a couple of months and I'll give it to anybody to speak to the family or whatever. And then, you know, you fucking. So, I got sick of saying, no, it's not true, and it's not true, and it's not true. And then the worst one, I lose work through it. The amount of work I've oh, I'm sorry, you're not. You, no, mate, I'm not doing this. You know, there was one time I was getting a job for 15 grand, and um, I'm sitting in Bournemouth in my apartment. And I'm waiting for the guy picking us up at like, say, four o'clock. And it happens four, and I say, Where are you? He says, Oh, you're in the news. You're in you're in Spain in rehab. Been there two weeks. I went, I'm not in fucking Spain. Where'd you get that from? He says, Oh, it's just been on the news. So I'll miss out on that job because the press were just telling lies. So I missed out on the fortune in regards to the lies side of it. Yeah. You know, and then you just try and sort of sit. So you just got to get somebody that's understanding. So, like, Katie's been a great help. So, if I'm struggling with anything, I'll just ring Katie and she'll get on to it for yeah. us and that. So, it's good to have that support. You How know? does it make you feel that guys like Wayne Rooney and stuff come forward when you were struggling to pay for rehab and stuff? They know you've got the backing from people who adored you. Yeah, it was nice of them. I heard that, you know, that they all chipped in and that. That was nice of them, um, you know, and. Uh, I really appreciated them for that, and I thanked them. I got the chance to thank everybody, you know, and then obviously with the PFE, I paid them back. So, you know, so it was nice. I'm sure I think Rooney can keep that 40, 40 quick. <laughs> <laughs> what about the round what hang the guy when you were doing the fishing rods? You were, you were bang on the drinking drugs then? Huh? Yeah, I, that's when I took bad. That's when my dad put me in a mental room for 11 days, you know, and that fucking pulled me around really well, and I didn't drink for a long time. After that, you know, that round war thing, I really honestly thought it was my friend and that and didn't realise what he had did to other people until obviously after about two weeks when I pulled myself around and thought, fucking hell. So that was quite embarrassing for everyone. But, you know, I got through that saga and then obviously did the apology again. Um, yeah, and I just, you know, I, like I said, I know, you know, it doesn't bother me drinking whether I drink or not, you know. It doesn't bother us. I know I'm more happier when sometimes not drinking. Um, you know, I'm, I can sometimes be sad drunk, I suppose, but 
Oh, man, I'm just enjoying life again. You know, last year, not just me, but the whole country who struggled with regards work and that. So all the work's coming back. He's been working a nuts off uh, with the, all the work coming through. So just staying on the right track and just enjoying the work that's ahead of us. Yeah, that's know. all you can do. What about Maradona? It was both of you meeting in the tunnel and you were yeah, both pissed. Because uh, I didn't, didn't play as against Juventus. I fucked up a year, Disney. And I says, all right, I'll play against Maradona. And, and I had a few bottles of champagne on the way on the flight. I was just in the tunnel and I went, Diego, oh, give me, I'm pissed. And he went, it's okay, guys, I saw my. <laughs> that was hilarious. And obviously I went out and beat five players and scored. And I looked at him and I says, fucking beat that. And, you know, he scored. And it was a great old free kick and that. And then it was just, afterwards I said, do the press conference. I can't really get my words out properly. He went, fuck off, you on your own. Um, yeah, but to see what's happened to him, you know. Yeah. I mean, the way he was with himself, was surprised he lasted as long as he did, you know. Yeah, Because I remember... When I first went in with that charity match as well in Manchester, and he was having a cigar, and he fucking, I look at Diego, all right, and he went, Casa, did you see how fucking fat I was last year? I mean, he was ballooned <laughs> right up, and I started laughing. I went, yeah, massive. Yeah, so, you know, God knows what he was, he was on in that. Because they say cocaine, and cocaine, you lose weight. He was massive, so fuck that. He must have, <laughs> I think he must have fucking hit himself. I think yeah. he's hit himself twice. A legend, man. Ah, yeah. great player. But you were classed as you're on the same ped, you're on the same bracket as legends yeah, as well. I mean, yeah, I loved it when I played. You know, I do miss it. I still miss it. I find it hard to watch football. Sometimes I find it hard when I see a player who fucking like on hundred grand a week, not bothered with the money, but he can't even trap a bag of cement. You know, what do you think you've spent through the years, Paul? Well, you know, people say I spent it all on drink and drugs. I'd, drugs are never and drink no because wherever I went, people were just buying this drink for free anyway. Like you know. I got divorced. Um, I gave a lot of money to my family. I mean, I must have bought my dad about 80 cars, two boats, and the amount of things. Um, I've always had my family out all my life. But I'm happy, you know. Um, spending quite a lot on things in the houses, and then being just renting, renting places. You know, but I, I, think, I just feel like now, the age I am, I'm just a happy-go-lucky guy, like, you yeah. know. Do you think you've been used a lot all your life, Paul? Yeah, some of the life? agents have used us, took the piss and that, and I just, I knew what they were doing, but I just let it go, you know. Um, and it's hard to find someone to trust, but, you know, when I got rid of the other two, or the other one, and then I just, I come here for a break, and I, I just thought, why don't I give Katie a chance to be my manager? And uh, I've never looked back since, Good to be fair. Man. Liam Gallagher. I know she's still ripping yeah. us off a little bit. <laughs> Classic manager. I mean, I've seen her go in the fridge before and pinch <laughs> me chocolate and fucking, she must think I'm thick. Yeah. But no, nah, she's, she's good. She comes round and checks and that makes sure everything's mm. okay, so, which is good, like you know, have someone you can trust. Yeah, Liam Gallagher's done a few videos, says that you were partying one night and he put out a fire extinguisher. It was in town. It was in London. And um, someone said, Liam Gallagher's in the restaurant, posh as fucking. I went, all right, so I got out the taxi and I went up and I went, hi, Liam. First time I met him, he went, oh, you all right, guys? I said, down. And he had a big fill of steak in front of him. And I had a couple of drinks and that. And he went, do you want a steak? I went, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not hungry. And he went, all right, I'm just two seconds. I'm going to the toilet. He went to the toilet and I fucking ate his steak. And he come back. And he went, where's my fucking steak? And I rubbed my stomach and I went, ah, cheers. And he went, fuck it. So I thought he's waiting to order another steak. And he come back with a fire thing, so I just fucking mullered us all <laughs> over. Wow, Jesus Christ. He just sprayed it all over his man, just all over the table. Didn't give a fuck. I just put it down. And then we just started eating again, having a few drinks. Yeah, I had some laughs with him. He's a good guy as well, fucking talented. Yeah, amazing guy. Yeah, yeah. so I've had an opportunity to meet a lot of famous people. Um, but I just take them as if one of me, you know. Like I said, I, I just feel like I'm just like a normal guy, you know, that, lucky enough to be good with his feet. Mm -hmm. I met a lot of people that, you know, that, I'm not no uh, Brian Robson. I'm in all of um, the others people I've met. It's just you know, I just take it as like they're just one of me. That's it, you know. Yeah. What's your best moment in football, Paul? Um, I think getting picked for England. Um, I think the goal, that goal when the press were what was out Euro '96 for Scotland. Um, I think I don't know. I just wherever I went, I just I think the best moment in football is when I. Uh, Obviously, it made me debut in Newcastle, but every time I put a shirt on, it means something for us, for the fans, like, you know. Um, and just when I play well, I feel like I've achieved something, you know. And 
I like I just I used to see it in Tottenham. Fucking I don't know why but I used to see the lads lads do us a favour. I'm fucking sick of getting man in the match, somebody else get it for the day. And the lads would laughing and I'd get man in the match. Um or I'd see it in the range of dress room while I used to laugh. And uh I used to laugh and I'd say, lads, let me tell you, just give us the ball and fucking keep bowling for a few minutes. Mm-hmm. I just wanged them up. So, you know, just all throughout my career. But I think some of the, I think the, the times were like, that Rangers thing, it was achievement. I mean, from midfield to score 38 goals, you know. Um, I enjoyed that. And every, I think every goal I scored for Rangers meant something, you know. You know, like, you know the celebrations. You look at some of the players now when they score. Dyes your, your hair blonde. Yeah, blonde, yeah, fucking hell. And then all the, play, all the fans start dying their hair, they're all like, <laughs> all ginger nuts. It's like, fucking hell, they're not blonde, man. Yeah. Yes, but, uh, you know, it's just every time I put a strip on, a shirt on, you know, I just look forward to it. Yeah, yeah, that, what a phenomenal career, Paul. When, like I say, you're adored all over the world, and even when people speak about you, their, their eyes like I know, up, the yeah. press give a stick and say you could have done better. Fuck them, man. Fuck it, I know. Yeah. I, I made four moves and I'm the most expensive player to move in four of things. I've achieved every fucking football course. I've loved by all the fans. You know, it was only the, the time where I missed... The only regret I have in football is missing them four years, you know. I could have got 100 cap for England. I missed, like, with the ligaments, that was a year. And then a broken knee cap, that was, like, another nine months. And then a year and a half with a broken fibula and tibia. Um, I try not to think about it because... You know, if I did, fuck knows what damage I would have done to players on the pitch if I did them yeah. injuries. But, you know, I just thought, fucking, I'm not going to, I don't know if I'm going to be able to play the way I used to. And then it was only when I stopped playing for Rangers and started beating players for fun. Um, yeah, I remember that, that Kilmarnock kid. He was a boxer, he used to be a boxer. He went to papers and said he's going to get fucking whoppers on the pitch. I was in the dressing room and I just said, oh, son, well, me, you worst nightmare. And, Patrick Thistle, I think it was, I scored two and put the ball through his legs and got sent off. And I remember going in the dressing room with my boots and says, yes, son, one day you play like that. He, I seen him when they doing a venue at Rangers Football Club. He turned up. He says, I've still got the boots. He yeah. says, fuck me, how bad is that, dear? And I just laughed. I felt, <laughs> then I felt embarrassed. I went, I know. He says, can you remember what you said to us? I went, yeah, I think so. Even though you're very outspoken and always the, like the class clown, was, were you doing that because you were shy, Paul? Yeah, sometimes it got away of the shyness. You know, I can be, I can get embarrassed quite quickly sometimes, and I do get the hump. But I sometimes overshadow it by like just being funny and that. And then sometimes I'm just natural. I, I do see things just comes off the cuff, and I will say, where did that come from? You know. Um, so I like to think I'm a funny guy, um, but can be serious as well when I want to be. But I don't like being serious. It's fucking boring. Yeah. Fuck it, life's too short, man. It's, I know, exactly. You look at all your highlights and it's all jokes and laughters and yeah, I know. world-class goals. So yeah. listen, mate, your legacy will live on for hundreds of thousands. So I say when I go on stage, I'm, yeah. I've got funny things to tell you, but I don't know about football. I can't fucking remember any of it. <laughs> so going forward, Paul, amazing career, mate. And like I say, you're loved by everyone. What's the plans for the future? Just whatever's, whatever, you know, as long as I stay well in that. Um, and then we've got, got quite a few, few venues laid out. We've got about eight, nine so far. I've just started coming out, saying things. Got this thing, um, hopefully it goes ahead. I mean, I was going to do Strictly Come Dancing in Italy, um, which was cancelled because of the virus. And then I was doing a documentary on the last show. That was cancelled the virus. So maybe got a book deal maybe coming up. And then just see what goes from there, you know? Yeah, but you I never just, shied away from a challenge, Paul. No, I never. And I think one thing just leads to another, you know, once mm. word gets around, like, I'm off Twitter, I'm off Instagram, I'm off Facebook and that, so I didn't use any of that because I got addicted to it and I kept on looking at it, thinking, oh, what, this and that. And it's like, what, what are you doing on a newspaper? Yeah, it's I know. negative bullshit. I know, exactly. So I didn't bother with any of that. And so really, I'm just trying to enjoy life as much as possible, you know, and just make the most of what I've got. Yeah. Before we finish up, Paul, when you done your knee, when it got shattered, see the guy that punched you, do you ever know him? No. Did they never come forward many no, years I th- later? I think what I, I did get told I one of the one of the, another guys chopped his hand off for doing it. Um but that was horrible. I remember going to the hospital and I was in, my leg was bent, I was agony, so it was only when I straightened it I was okay. And the nurse pushed my knee down and I've thumb went right through. And I went, It's okay, you've heard it. I went, fucking hold on. I said, My kneecaps yammering on my thigh, I could feel the lump, yeah. She went, no, it's not. I think she was fighting to tell us. So I got on the phone to the physio at Tottenham. I said, I think I fucking broke my knee, cut me off. So I jumped in a taxi and uh, headed to London at 1 o'clock in the morning. 
I remember the fucking car breaking down on the motorway. I was like, fucking hell, and the police stopped us. The police pulled up. And I was sitting in the back, and he says, oh, guys, what's happened? I went, I broke my fucking kneecap. So he, he got the car working again, and I managed, and I was just straight in the hospital. And it was an amazing job he did. He pulled it back down, like, on a levy, and then, you know, like a champagne bottle with a wire. Mm-hmm. That's what he did my kneecap. And then sewed it back up. And then so that was tough, because I, I couldn't move, and I stayed on the set there for three months, which wasn't too bad. I just get the gun out and shoot Jimmy up the arse, something to do, and then dye the hair different colours. Mm-hmm. So that three months was tough. But yeah, you know, they're, they're just the only regrets. I'm stupid, that challenge, I shouldn't yeah. have been there for the the challenge on Charles, like, you know, but yeah, so it's really just just enjoy life, like, you know. How's the relationship with Jimmy now? I've I I spoken for about uh, 10 lost, years now. Apparently lost a lot of weight, 13 yeah, or something. Yeah, I've spoken about 10 years. He went to the papers and did a story, which was, in, was lies, like, you know. So trust issues just going again. Yeah, I, over again. twice he did it, and he obviously made the money, and then got used it to get married or something. Mm-hmm. So I've just not spoken to him. Just before we finish up, Paul, I know you lost your dad a couple of years ago. How did you handle that? Not very good. Um, I mean, I was so close to my dad. Really, was close to my dad. You know, um, it was funny as well when he um, when it was just me and him in the hospital bed, and he, he passed away, and that. I fucking jumped on the bed and punched him. I headbutted and punched him, got my own fucking back when I was younger. And then I just lied and hugged him for 45 minutes. And then um, it was only like, you just think he's still there. And then I think mean, now and again, the Saturdays I miss him because I used to like put his bets on for him and sit with him and uh, watch, watch some of the football. And just stay at his for days, like, you know. Um, so yeah, Saturdays more I miss him more than anything else. Yeah, badly. And he was so dry. Like, you talk to you for an hour, he wouldn't fucking talk to me. <laughs> he talked to Katie, he talked to anyone, not me. Fucking hell. Yeah. Our dad, yeah. I was it? Do you want a cup of tea, Dad? You go, happy state. Fucking hell. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, he's, he was dry, but I loved to take them all around the all around the world with us when I played, like, you know. He would have been proud of you, Paul, he man. Loved the it, yeah. memories that you give him, man. So you should be proud as well, mate, that mm. everything that you've achieved in life and, be, and still standing here fighting, trying to kick on for a better year this year as well. It, it shows you your character, Paul. Yeah. How does it feel talking about your past and, and certain stories? Do you mind? It, uh, sometimes, like, at the moment, I'm about you all right. Probably in a few hours' time. Tired. I, uh, no, I'll just be thinking about it. Thinking, you know, good times I had. You know, I like to think I had more good times than I did bad times, especially the football side of it. And no one could ever take that away from us, you know. Um, I just still sometimes wish I was playing now. But I, I need a hip operation, so I'll get that done. I might stop playing for the over 50s. <laughs> Who knows? But you're not supposed to be playing for Tottenham because you were out running and shit. You yeah, were putting, well, you were I trained fat. and all that. Yeah. And then we were all given a pair of new boots. And I had my own pair, and I thought, oh, I may as well wear these new ones. And because of new boots, and I didn't warm up properly. And I just felt my Achilles go straight away. Oh, I was gutted. Just the last five minutes. But, you know, what a stadium that was. I mean, Katie and Matt come. But, yeah, the, even the fans were fantastic towards us as well, like, you know. Yeah. Um, so it's hard. It's hard. I like, I like to go to games, but I just get past it. I never get to watch the games. You know, guys are, how are you doing? What's up? And we can have a selfie. And that's fucking hell. So I end up sometimes leaving after 15 minutes. Just yeah. going to the toilet. Fuck, mm-hmm. I'll be in the house watching the second half. Yeah. Paul, listen, brother, for coming on today and telling your story. It's been amazing. Pleasure. But before we finish up, Paul Gascoigne is known as a funny man. Give me one of your funny stories before we end. Oh, my God, not in the door. says, oh, guys, I'm from the sun. I says, I'm from the earth. Now, fuck off. <laughs> now, I want to say, Tottenham, I want to play for Tottenham. And uh, the lads went, guys, I'll do something funny. I went, no, I can't. I says, the press are watching. I'm just being bought for 2.2 million. I've got to be fucking serious. And I went, ah, you born bastard. So now I'm driving home and I got wound up. So I look across the road on the way home and I see a zoo. And I thought, that's okay. So I went home and I couldn't sleep. I knew what I was going to be doing. So at quarter eight, I went to the zoo, claimed the fence sort of thing, not on the guy's door who owned the zoo, lived in the... Uh, I said, need a favour? He went, fucking hell, poor guy. what do you want? Anything. I went, ostrich, please. So he went, you want a fucking ostrich? Yeah, please. So he gives an ostrich and I put on my eight shirt on the back. And I went on the training ground, and it was so fucking funny. And I'm waiting for the lads training, and I get this sausage out of the back of the car, and I threw it on the fucking training pitch. Where you fucking lads were fucking laughing their heads off, and this ostrich is <laughs> running all over with a gas going on my shirt on. But what was funny, the lads finished training at half past 12. You ever try catching a fucking ostrich? <laughs> so I got to finish around about five o'clock. 
caught the ostrich because I got tangled up in the, the shirt and uh, I took it back to the zoo. He fucking went off and she said, look, the fuck, what are you doing to me ostrich? The feathers were all over the place and everything. Mm. I went, the gaffer doesn't want it, it's shit in front of the girl, <laughs> but it's quick as fuck. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I've had some good laughs. Paul, listen, mate, God bless you, Cheers, brother. Mate. Thanks for coming on uh, today. Pleasure, man. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure all mine, mate. Take Cheers. Care. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.